this is an opportunity to have a cozy and intimate conversation about the value of society, which this week of all weeks seems to be a very sort of salient topic to be, uh, to be thinking about. Uh, before I pass to our moderator for our first panel, I want to tease our next two Compass events. Um, the first of those will be four weeks from today on Friday, April 1st, on the topic, Should Open Societies Have Open Borders? And the second will be five weeks from today on Friday, April 8th, on the topic, Can Markets Be Immoral? Both of those events will be experimenting with a new Compass format called Compass Forums, um, which will be uh, more intentionally designed than most Compass events have to date uh, to foster civil discourse. Those events will be moderated by two undergraduate students, and there will be an effort to apply a set of civil discourse principles that uh, we at the center have been developing this year um, and will be sort of rolling out in, in the coming weeks. So I, I urge you to come to those events, which will also be held in person uh, over at the Faculty Club. Four weeks from today and five weeks from today uh, uh, through Compass. So today our first panel is called the value of no, what is it called? <laughs> <laughs> it's on the value of openness. The value, the value of open society. Thank you. The value of open society. <laughs> Check my notes before I talk. Um, and we moderated by my friend and colleague Peter Turner, who is your associate professor of philosophy here at Ohio State. He is also the director of the Center for Ethics and Values, and my co-pilot on many uh, important tests. Great. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thanks uh, for those of you who are here, and uh, hello to our live stream audience out there. Um, so it's really my pleasure to introduce our speakers for the first panel. The way we're going to do this is give them some time, about 15 minutes each, to put some uh, big ideas on the table. This panel is really intended to be uh, the kind of general uh, the general panel where we think broadly about the value of open society, uh, what are the sort of the benefits of openness? Uh, what are we? What are the things that we're worried about remaining open? And then what are the challenges about that kind of openness? What are what are we even uh, thinking about as 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 we go forward? Uh, so uh, with that, they're going to put each of them have the opportunity to put some big ideas on the table for us to consider. We're then going to follow that up with a bit of moderated discussion uh, led by me. And then um, we're going to open it up to uh, questions and conversation here uh, with the people who are here in the room. So with that, let me begin. We're going to start with Alison uh, Stanger and follow up with uh, Michael Furstein. Uh, Alison Stanger is uh, Russell Lang, uh, 60, Professor of International Politics and Economics at Middlebury College. Uh, this year, she's also a co-lead of a Theory of AI Practice Initiative at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. Um, she's an external professor and science board member at the Santa Fe Institute and a senior advisor to the Open Society University Network, uh, Hannah Arendt Humanities Network. Um, she's got a very distinguished record. I, I won't summarize it all here, but she's, she's published very widely uh, in, in, in both uh, academic uh, venues and, um, and in public uh, in magazines and writings for the general public. She's a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and she's the author, editor of uh, multiple books, uh, including uh, Whistleblowers, Honesty in America, From Washington to Trump, and uh, One Nation Under Contract, The Outsourcing of American Power and the Future of Foreign Policy. I'll stop there, but really there's a lot more I could say. Um, we're just thrilled to have her. Um, similarly, Mike Furstein is, uh, is is also, and we're just thrilled to have him here too, and he's an associate professor of philosophy at St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota, not far from uh, Minneapolis. Um, he is uh, the recipient of many grants from like the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Mellon Foundation, the Whiting Foundation, the DeCarman Foundation, Institute for Social and Economic Research and Policy, and the, and the Institute for Humane Studies. He's on the editorial board of the Journal of Political Philosophy and the Academy of Management Review, and he's published widely in leading uh, academic journals. And he's currently finishing up a book uh, entitled Experiments in Living Together, which offers a model of social progress in democracy. So uh, Mike, uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, and so let's, we'll hand it over first to Allison and then, and then move to Mike and then to the moderated discussion following. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Should I speak with my mask on, do you think? 
I, I'm comfortable with you doing either one at this point. Okay. I'll we're keep, we're I'll in. Keep it on just to be. We're in this middle ground where things yeah. are opening up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know. I know. How open should we be? That is the question. No, if you can't hear me, tell me and I'll take it off. But I've been lecturing with this mask on, so I think it'll it'll be okay. Okay. Uh, it, first of all, I want to thank you for the invitation to be here. It's exciting to be in the belly of the beast, so to speak, because uh, my whole family is a big University of Michigan family. I'm sorry to say. Please don't throw anything at me or hurt me, because that would not be good. That's actually <laughs> happened to me in East Lansing as a little kid when I was riding with the Michigan shirt on. and. Um, Someone water hosed me and I fell off my bike. And I did not understand why that was. But it's, 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 exciting, it's exciting to be here. I wanted to take some time to just throw out some big thoughts just uh, to generate some discussion. I think with Russia's uh, savage invasion of Ukraine as a backdrop, the value of open society seems imminently clear. You kind of have this you know, titanic struggle between open societies and closed societies. And Putin, is, we might say, is the arch enemy of the open society. Putin could not get away with such savage cruelty in an open society. You know, a prerequisite for him getting away with what he's getting away with is that that society is completely closed. So what I'd like to do is, is sketch three reasons that Karl Popper's concept of the open society is valuable today in 2022. And I then want to conclude by sharing some new archaeological evidence that offers the intriguing possibility of open societies existing prior to the advent of industrial capitalism. In other words, we all have this idea that the open society is a creation of Europe. It kind of develops hand in hand with the development of um, industrial capitalism. And there really is new research that pretty precisely demonstrates that it's possible to have open society without markets. So I want to just introduce you to that a little bit. Uh, and we can discuss it. So first of all, why is Karl Popper's work still valuable today? I just reread it um, this year. That's a massive tome and well worth our time. I'm surprised he's not taught more. But, but um, I think he really sheds light on contemporary problems in three ways. First, uh, it helps us to understand the challenges that big tech poses to the open society. Second, it can restore our faith in economic interventionism in the public interest. And third, it can help us come to a clear understanding of ongoing debates over uh, wokeness and identity politics in this country and in other countries. So that's the big picture, three things I wanted to discuss. Let me just address each of these in turn. Turn. In the open society and its, and its enemies, Popper's treatment of Karl Marx sheds light on the challenges that big tech poses to open society. That is both Popper and Marx, who might say, agree on what the key question was, the question for both Popper and Marx is not who wields power, but how it is wielded. According to Popper, Marx hated capitalism. And I think this is true from my understanding of Marx. He hated capitalism not for its, accumu uh, its accumulation of wealth, but for its oligarchical character. He finds Marx's condemnation of capitalism a fundamentally moral one, and one that reflects faith in an open society. For, so for Karl Popper, Karl Marx is a believer in open society. And this is the problem with big tech that I maybe don't need to even convince you about. There has been this shift in the balance of power that is truly striking and in many respects alarming. I'm writing a, a, new, a book right now called Who Elected Big Tech? Because what I see is this increasing usurpation of what would previously be considered government functions by private actors. And these private actors are very, very powerful corporations that are multinational in scope. So in my view, you know, we're living at a moment for political thinking or political theorizing that 
is as ripe for contributions as the age of democratic um, and communist revolutions. We've got a new problem, and the new problem is we've got this power that is effectively global because these corporations are multinational. And yet we don't have a way of thinking about how that power might be fairly used or contained. So that's a big challenge that I'm trying to look at in my work. So, and it's just the evidence, I won't belabor this point, there's just, if you just follow this in the news in the last week, you see Microsoft, Facebook, and others having effectively foreign policies. They, they are not neutral on this topic. They are siding with the open society and with the United States, which I think is a really positive development, but it raises the question, what is the appropriate relationship between government and, and Facebook or government and Google? Should, should we nationalize the Russian arms of these companies? You know, make there be closer collaboration on security to protect democracy? These are really interesting questions. But the main point here is that big tech has the potential to stifle free expression of ordinary people without which an open society can, uh, um, cannot exist. Okay, so you have them making choices about speech and censorship. The big example, of course, is this, of this is the, the uh, uh, deplatforming of Donald Trump, who was, at the time, the President of the United States. Many of my friends applauded this, but when you really stop to think about it, it's not necessarily a good precedent for companies to be deciding what speech is protected and what speech isn't. So we can come back to that in the Q&A if you like. Um, the, the, the whole point here is that the global nature of the ad market for Google and Facebook represents a grave challenge for American electoral integrity. And actually, we might see these developments in the past week or so as very positive developments because to me it makes no sense whatsoever to allow Russia to buy political ads in the United States. And you could develop AI to stop that in a moment, right? You could just set, uh, develop an algorithm that would just reject any requests for advertising from a Russian domain. So these are things we'll be thinking about in the future. I think we want to avoid this uh, prospect of an alliance between authoritarian states and large IT monopolies that would effectively merge corporate and state surveillance, as Jar George Soros has so um, presciently warned. I think this is happening in places like China. <laughs> we definitely don't want that happening in the United States because it's the end of open society. So second uh, uh, value of Karl Popper today is the importance, he, he highlights the importance of economic intervention, of government intervention into the economy. For po Popper, Marx was a man on whom the immiseration of ordinary people made enormous impression, and he, he sought to find something to do about it. Marx avoided moralizing because he, he thought of himself as a scientist. He hated preaching. Um, but he was a deeply humane man who valued freedom. Uh, Popper teaches us that, that there's a bridge between Marxist activism and histor his historicism. Because we all know that for Marx, the capitalist system was doomed at so, so the task for good humans was to shorten and lessen the birth pangs of the new order, right? Marx was mistaken on this sort of, sort of a philosophy of history, but, but he was a deeply moral man for Popper. So what would that look like? What kind of intervention does he have in mind? Popper really channels Keynes, if you read the work, in announcing we must demand that, un this is a direct quote, we must demand that unrestrained capitalism give way to an economic interventionism which is what the Biden administration is pursuing today. The third point I wanted to make about the value of Karl Popper for um, contemporary political affairs is that I think it can shed light 
on today's identity politics and the polarization that's taking place, particularly in places like Ohio, the state of Ohio. Um, you're in a little blue bubble here, I imagine. But I'm from Indiana. I just came from Indiana yesterday. And we all know that this country is deeply divided on not only fundamental issues, but on the very question of what facts are. Uh, that's enormously destructive for open society. That's enormously destructive for scientific inquiry and innovation. It's also destructive for our own public health in many ways. So I think Popper would have hated wokeness. He would have hated it because he's very much uh, of the position that ideology is not thinking. People aren't thinking for themselves when they're following any kind of ideology, and a lot of today's identity politics involves a lot of ideology. But I think Popper would have loved the Black Lives Matter movement, which, in my view, is striving to promote an understanding of our shared history that dwells in the fact-based world rather than in myth. So it's just an attempt to set the historical record right. And that's something that intellectuals should be interested in having happen. Um, in fact, it's super exciting to think about the possibilities of studying European thought while simultaneously acknowledging the contributions of non-Europeans that have previously to date gone unacknowledged. Um, that is a very exciting uh, thing for pedagogy. And that's an exciting thing just for thought because we seem to have reached some sort of dead end with capitalism. We've seen what central planning looks like. You know, that's not what we want if we want to preserve open society, but is there some kind of way to innovate our way out of this? Come up with some alternative forms of social organization that allow us to be free while simultaneously not um, uh, facilitating this enormously damaging inequality we see kind of spiraling out of control in the United States. So my reading of Karl Popper, just to summarize my reflections on Popper, is that he had a cautious optimism regarding progress. And our task for him is not to aim for the perfect, because the perfect is unattainable, but for the best option among bad alternatives. So he sort of has this almost uh, Churchillian understanding of the meaning of um, democracy. You know, it's the. <laughs> is a terrible system, except when you look at the alternatives. But, but, and this comes to the second point I want to leave you with, big point, is that recent archaeological evidence suggests that focusing on Popper and progress may give us only part of the story. Popper implicitly assumes throughout the work that open society is an invention of the West, as, it is, as is industrial capitalism. But in their fascinating new book, The Dawn of the New Everything, David Graeber and David Wengra. Anybody read this book, The Dawn of the New Everything? It's on the, it's, you know, got thousands of reviews on Amazon. It's a big tome. I highly recommend it to you. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta add it to, you can add it to courses and just get awesome discussions. Uh, just a masterful work. But they persuasively argue that we may have sold, hum short humanity's capacity for innovation. What do they mean by that? Well, they mean that by focus, focusing exclusively on European open society, we have developed a tunnel vision that, in a sense, makes us blind to other alternatives that have existed in history. And he traces this back to the social contractarian uh, tradition within Western political thought. In other words, that social contract view, be it Hobbes, be it Locke, be it Rousseau, whatever, uh, gives us an understanding of human nature. It may be subtly different. They're not just subtly, it's really different among the different accounts, but it's one that's ultimately impoverished because you're dealing with savages who become civilized when they form the social contract. And that might be a uh, misunderstanding. So what's the big takeaway from this? 702-page masterpiece. The big takeaway is that indigenous Americans lived in open societies without market economies, without money. 
And I want to discuss the case where the evidence is most persuasive. They give many, many examples uh, that free markets are not a necessary condition for open society. Uh, I'm going to, um, there are num numerous other examples and these new sites that have been discovered, Poverty Point. Have you ever heard of Poverty Point? I hadn't heard of it before. It's at the mouth of the Mississippi River. Unbelievable. I'm going to go to a lot of these sites um, this summer. But um, there's also, actually, you have sites right here in Ohio. Central Ohio is, I guess, is this considered Central Ohio? Yeah, yeah it we're, is. We're the center of Central Ohio. Okay, so wait, what county are you in? Franklin. Okay, you're in Franklin County. Well, have you heard of a county known as um, uh, Licking? Yes. Okay. You're kidding. Okay, so guys, uh, excuse me, not guys. People, let's go, <laughs> let's, you should go to Licking County where you have the Hopewell sites yep. and the Newark Earthworks, okay, which are prominently featured in this book. You could take students on a field trip to those sites. But what I want to focus on here is this brilliant Wendat statesman, uh, Kandiaronk, who was chief of the Hurons, or what indigenously the, the, the Wendat people, who dwelled in the straits between the upper peninsula, peninsula of Michigan and the Mitten. I think they were based out of Mackinac Island, which is a be another beautiful place to visit. And this statesman, Candiaronk, is buried in um, Montreal's Notre Dame. He's known as La, Ho La Hontan, La Hontan, I guess you would say, in French sources. And he wrote comparatively about Wendat society and European society and their socioeconomic organization. Um, and guess what? He preferred Wendat society. I'll just give you one quote here, which is from um, a French source. And he's speaking, Candy Aronk is speaking in 1703. And I may be mispronouncing his name because I haven't had time to go check with the Huron people, how, how you would actually pronounce this properly. But here's what he says in 1703 in English. I have spent six years reflecting on the state of European society, and I still can't think of a single way they act that's not inhuman. And I genuinely think this can only be the case as long as you stick to your distinctions of mine and thine. I affirm that what you call money is the devil of devils. And his, these opinions were not, were not obscure. Uh, Conde Aronk's opinions were translated into German, English, Dutch, and Italian, again under this name of La, La Hontan, um, and were in print in multiple editions for over a century. So any self-respecting intellectual of the 18th century would have been almost certain to have read them. Even more strikingly, just about every major French Enlightenment figure tried their hand at a La Houghton style critique of their own society, from, that is, from the perspective of some imagined outsider. So Montesquieu chose a Persian. The Marquis uh, d'Argent, a Chinese uh, man. Diderot chose a Tahitian. Uh, Chateaubriand, a Natchez. Voltaire, uh, Voltaire's L'Ingenue was half Wendat and half French. So what this book tells us is that, that this is just one example of many. It tells us that about the only thing we can infer, infer about socioeconomic arrangements prior to the European nation state is that it was extraordinarily diverse and super interesting, not just some dark hole that we shouldn't look at. And there are numerous examples of egalitarian societies in which women had a prominent role and decisions were made deliberatively. Yet there was no money. So open societies without capitalism. I'll conclude with that thought because I think it just is a seed for all sorts of free thinking about what sort of alternative arrangements we might have and the reforms we might need to continue to have open societies. So thank you for your attention. Great, thank you very much. Um, uh, and now Michael Furstein. Thanks, Piers, and uh, 
Yeah, I think, I think there are some good points of overlap here. So, cool. peers, you may have to do a bit of a tap dance and you know, kind of sewing everything together, but I, I do think there's, there's some fodder between us. Good. Right. Um, okay. I want to talk about three ideas that are usually taken to go together, but I, I think have some tension between them. The first is the idea of the open society. The second is the idea of social progress. And the third is the idea of rationality. By the open society, I just have in mind this tradition of thought that we've been talking about, which goes through Karl Popper, John Stuart Mill, John Dewey, Friedrich Hayek, people like that. Um, and I take the open society to have two core commitments. And maybe this is something we will talk about more, but the first commitment is something like a non-coercion principle. And the non-coercion principle just says that, or an anti-coercion principle, there's a very high threshold for coercive interference with liberty. So freedoms of speech, thought, association, lifestyle, the stuff that John Stuart Mill talks about in On Liberty. The second is what you might call the democratic principle. And the democratic principle says that there should be some widely distributed meaningful capacity for meaningful participation in the social life. And in particular, for the capacity to contest matters of public concern that affect individuals or groups' interests. So a kind of negative principle, this is what you can't do, an anti-coercion principle and a kind of positive principle, there's this capacity that people need to be able to contest stuff that matters. That's how I think about the open society. I don't know if it's perfectly historically accurate, but I think it captures some core notions that a lot of these people were on to. Okay, the second idea is social progress. This is something we could talk about a lot, but I just have in mind something very intuitive, simple. So there are better and worse ways things could go from a moral point of view. And when it goes better, that's progress. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Now, we could talk about examples, right? So sometimes it's hard to know if we're making progress. We can argue about, like, is this or not progress? Or people, these, this thing can be very contested. But I think in the open society tradition, people generally assume there is such a thing as social progress and that human societies are capable of it, OK? Um, the third thing, rationality, also potentially a quite freighted, theoretically complicated notion. Again, I want to work with something for present purposes that's just quite intuitive. Rationality is about a kind, the right kind of sensitivity to reasons or evidence. So updating your beliefs and practices based on evidence as opposed to impulse, blind deference to authority, tradition, kind of emotion, um, or impulsive emotion, maybe sometimes emotion can be rational, right? But certain kinds of impulsive emotional states. So I, th I think of rationality to some degree as kind of a contrast concept, right? It stands apart from certain ways of updating our beliefs. All right. Traditionally, I think the link between these ideas goes like this. The open society is good because the open society tends to promote social progress. There might be other reasons it's good, but that's one significant reason why it's good. However, it's a necessary condition of its doing so that there be some sufficient social rationality. Like people have to be rational, or the institutions and practices that define the open society don't tend to promote social progress. So Popper, um, and I am not a big Popper guy, but um, I, I read a little Popper in, in, in the open society and its enemies. Popper contrasts the open society with the closed society. And what's the closed society? The closed society is a place where basically people demonstrate a blind deference to cultural conventions. And they don't, he uses the word, they don't rationally examine their practices to improve them. Similarly, John Stuart Mill, in the famous discussion and on liberty, he says, well, if we have a kind of open contest of ideas and practices, that's how we're going to improve things. Why? Because people will have more justified beliefs. Well, well, why would they have more justified beliefs unless they were sensitive sufficiently to evidence? So there's this kind of necessary condition lurking in the background. And likewise, John Dewey talks about intelligence, which is a more complicated idea, but 
there is some overlap there. So the open society tends to promote progress, but only if there is some sufficient degree of social rationality. That, I think, is the traditional argument, at least distilled into something kind of simple. All right. Um, now, the obvious thing to say at this point is that people are not that rational, <laughs> right? Um, and like, we don't need scholarship to illustrate this. We could just look at, you know, just take a look around what's going on in American politics. I mean, almost 50% of Republicans, according to a recent poll, believe the QAnon theory. Um, so, you know, there are plenty of examples of this on both sides of the political divide or on all sides of the political divide. But there is a lot of scholarship also piling on this point. I mean, there are many books that have come out over the past 10 years or so documenting the irrationality of um, the American public. So Jason Brennan's Against Democracy would be one example. Brian Kaplan's The Myth of the Rational Voter. Liliana Mason's book on civil agreement. Um, Ilya Soman has a book, and on and on. I mean, there's a whole, Larry Bartles's book, um, Democracy for Realists, Christopher Aiken. Anyway, there's a lot of, there's a lot of scholarship documenting this point. We're not gonna survey that now, but just to give you a flavor for it, if you're not familiar with this literature, I'm guessing many people here are, but um, Baruch Fiskoff and Caitlin Drummond, two social scientists, I think at Carnegie Mellon, did a study a couple years ago where they tried to assess the relationship between people's education and scientific literacy and their views about scientific issues like climate change. Now, if people were rational, you would expect that there would be like a positive association. Like the more scientifically literate you are, the more your views would tend to converge with the scientific consensus on things like climate change. But no, <laughs> not true. Um, if you're a liberal or a, like a Democrat type of person, then as your level of scientific literacy goes up, your views tend to converge more with the scientific consensus. But if you are a conservative, then as your scientific literacy goes up, your beliefs tend to go away from the scientific consensus on topics like climate change. Now, for topics without a partisan valence, like nanotechnology, you don't get the same effect. Um, but for topics like climate change, you do. Now, if you think people are rational, this is, um, this is very surprising. Why would this be? But if you recognize that we are basically a bunch of tribal, partisan, motivated reasoners who approach political and social issues in more or less the way that Ohio State fans approach the game with Michigan or whatever, then it makes a lot of sense. What's, what's going on? Well, people are just like weaponizing their knowledge, their rationality, if you like, to prop up some identity affirming cheerleader type rah rah, my group wins, your group loses belief system, right? So this is kind of, this is pretty depressing. I, I think just looking around is pretty depressing these days when it comes to rationality, and so is the scholarly literature. Now, having said all that, there are some amazing scholars out there doing empirical work, um, showing that under certain, I'm, I'm looking over to Mike, he's not looking back at me, right? But uh, <laughs> there are, there is some great work in under the rubric of deliberative democracy, showing that when you get people together under the right kinds of circumstances, and you tutor them with experts and they read briefings and you get the right cross section and you create disincentives to be like a total self-serving jerk, people can be pretty rational. So I don't wanna overstate the point. It's not that we're just hopelessly irrational. I think the general point is that people struggle to achieve this except under sort of carefully managed conditions. That's what I, that's my read of the empirical literature. All right. Um, so, what do we take from this? I have three things to say. One comment, two questions. My comment. First, it seems to me this shows that there is some significant tension, maybe not 
particular, maybe not irresolvable, between the core commitments that define the open society and rationality. Let's take a case like Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan, the most popular podcast host in the US, I guess, maybe in the world, I don't know. He has on a bunch of fringe anti-vaxxer characters. And then Neil Young says, I'm taking all my music off of Spotify because you are polluting the information ecosystem and making people die. Um, now, of course, Neil Young is right that he's polluting the information ecosystem and making people die. Um, however, like, there's a problem here. From the standpoint of the open society, I don't think you're supposed to do that. You're not supposed to exert powerful, you're not supposed to use your power to coerce people to stop talking or to deplatform them. I think that goes against the open society ideal, right? Both of those principles, democratic participation on coercion. On the other hand, rationality. If so, we're trying to uh, promote progress by getting people to think clearly and attend to the right information. And, and so it seems like what Neil Young's doing is on the side of reason, but maybe not exactly on the side of the open society. So there's a tension. I mean, similarly, Donald Trump, should, should Twitter boot him off the platform, right? Donald Trump is like a super fun site of lies and misinformation. Um, a never ending stream of toxic waste going into the public's diet of <laughs> of reality or perceptions of reality. Now, should Twitter kick him off? Well, irrationality on the one hand, the open society on the other. I don't think you're supposed to kick people off Twitter platforms because they say stuff that you think is false, right? That, that I think is not in the book about what you do in the open society. Um, so I think there's a tension there. That's my comment. Okay, question one. Given this tension, what is, for us open society liberals, and I put myself in that camp, what is the relative priority of those two principles, the non-coercion principle and the democratic principle, as weighed against this kind of commitment to reason? So how comfortable are we with curating the information environment or the deliberative environment, right? Or how do we feel about um, rational epistemic hierarchies and public institutions which promote them to give some people a louder megaphone because they're credible and to suppress other people, other people's volume, let's say, because we think they're not credible. We, I don't know who we is, but um, so that's the first question. I, I think this is a challenge for the open society liberals. How do you, how do you navigate this tension and how, how comfortable are you kind of managing the speech environment? particularly in an era when, like in some ways, the internet is breaking down all these hierarchies. From an open society standpoint, you should think, great, there's all this partic robust participation. So many people can get involved. The ordinary person has their voice. Yeah, but it seems like that wasn't so good. Maybe it was better when Walter Cronkite just told everybody what was true. Was that better from the standpoint of the open society? All right, second question, and this is my, my last Thought. And this comes to the issue of wokeness. In light of what I've just said about rationality, how credible are the conventional prescriptions of open society liberals like me when we tell progressive activists to stop deplatforming people, Twitter mobbing them, sicking the diversity industrial complex on anyone who says something that's slightly at odds with some doctrinaire view about the capitalist, racist, um, hierarchy, right? Like, we had Peter Singer come to St. Olaf recently, virtually, but then there was still a virtual boycott for the virtual event. Um, what were they boycotting him for? Well, he's, he has very controversial which, which views which about disabilities. Right. End of life, beginning of life stuff. Yeah. Anyway, Google Singer disability. You'll, um, it's like, no, don't boycott Peter Singer. Show up and listen and have a rational debate. You know, don't be such, you irrational activists are, are really like, you're doing the wrong thing. And I think there's something a bit disingenuous about that. Even I'm the one saying this stuff. 
come on. I mean, I run a program called a public affairs conversation where we try to model this sort of rational debate. But let's get real. I mean, is that really, do we really believe what we're saying that this is how you're gonna change the mind of people at the top of some powerful social order? Right? If there's really profound injustice in the world, is, is, that, is that really how it works? Um, now maybe there, in the perfect world, it does work like that. Everybody's rational, everybody deliberates, we update our beliefs, right? And great, progress. But there's, there's sort of a collective action problem, right? It's like, if you're in a world where lots of other people are defecting from the optimal norms, then it's not clear it really makes a lot of sense for you to abide by them and be a rational good guy. And I, I think we open society liberals or just I can't speak for all of you, but you know anyone, let's say, who embraces these principles has to think about that. What are we really saying um, in these cases, and, and what what exactly is the right open society prescription when we're talking about really significant entrenched forms of injustice? All right, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks. So before I jump in asking some questions I have, um, I thought maybe, Allison, if you had any, uh, I saw you writing some things down. Did you want to say anything directly in response to what Mike was saying? Or? I have tons of stuff to say, but I, I'll, I'll Well, why don't we, why don't we start time. that way? Because I think, you know, you, why don't we, I would love to see you each just sort of respond a little bit to what the other person had to say just to get us going, and then I'm happy to also jump in. Okay. Well, I wrote, a, it was a great uh, set of comments, so I have a lot of Remarks in response. Um, Great. I guess the first thing I would say that your reflections made me think about is to what extent do the very notions of scientific literacy and rationality need re redefinition? Um, I'm thinking of here, you know, in the behavioral sciences today, there's this real critique of what's called homo economicus, this idea that you know, rational actors pursue their own self-interest. And this has been proven to be wrong in numerous contexts. Uh, I just co-edited a book with Brian Arthur and Eric Beinhocker on complexity economics, which is really blowing up that principle and saying that, that um, you know, the subject of, of rational actor theory or traditional economics is not a cognitively plausible subject. Why? Because people don't all think alike. Uh, there are cultural inputs to how people think. There are gender-based inputs into how people think. Not that we, are, you know, can, we can't all be outliers, but you can really systematically show this. And the, the, the most recent advances in cognitive science, which is important for you know, the work that I'm doing in artificial intelligence, they show that basically the idea of the Cartesian subject has to be thrown on the dustbin of history because we are not rational. Rational, uh, let me put it this way, rationality itself is bound up with emotion. In other words, when we reason uh, when we exercise our cognitive skills, we are using, they can show this, you're using both, you know, this reptilian brain, the amygdala and so forth, and your neocortex. And so just this idea that there's this Cartesian subject out there, just, I think, therefore I am. Well, no, you know, you think because you're also in a body. And your, your body is the product of thousands of years of evolution. And... How do, we, how do we think about that within the terms you're, you're talking about? So, um, you know, how, how can we reconceptualize and come up with a cognitively plausible subject? And I think that just makes us have to pay a lot more attention to culture and a lot more uh, attention to difference in how humans define rationality. And that, that Graeber and Wengrow book, again, is challenging, pushing back on that notion of what a rational person chooses. So that's just one point I make. The second point I make about Neil Young, I'm not sure that has anything to do with cancel culture because Neil Young is not abolishing his music. He's just saying, I don't want to have it on that platform. The music is still available. So he's not canceling himself any, any, any uh, stretch of the way. 
It's just you can't access it through the platform he's protesting. Um, the, other, the other thing that you, I have two more points I want to make about what your remarks generated, which is a sign of a good set of remarks, right? And that's that um, I think we can make a very serious argument that capitalism itself, or if you want to call it big tech, is undermining uh, both the coercion principle and the democratic principle, and I wonder what you would say about that, because um, again, the structure of the economy itself can, it's almost like a story of you couldn't get liberal democracy without the development of industrial capitalism. Those two things went hand in hand, but now that democracy is established, it's almost as though capitalism is at odds with democracy. And what do we do about that? That's, that's an interesting question to me. And finally, um, the reason I asked you about Peter Singer is uh, I'm on the editorial board of this new journal he started with Jeff McMahon called the Journal of Controversial Ideas. Yeah. And I just wondered if, um, if uh, the student, students were protesting just that idea as opposed to particular views he had on subjects. I'm just, it, it, I'm, it's definitely about the, the ableism thing. It's definitely about his attitudes towards people with disabilities specifically. Well, what, what, is, what does he really say about people with disabilities? So um, I, yeah. to say, I think this yeah, would be sorry. a bit of a detour yeah. because we would go, yeah. I think, go on about it. But yeah. it, I mean, he has come under a, a lot of fire for sort of how he, how he views certain kinds of certain cases. Yeah, um, in and, and, yeah. cases in the about people in the moral severely status. cognitively disabled. These two things became terminally ill, right? And in the first, I think, month after birth. I see. Yeah, under certain okay. conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I just yeah. haven't read that. It's a very so. hedged view. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, Mike, do you want to have any follow-up comments? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess it make, I should probably respond first, and then yeah. does that make sense? Sure. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. On the relevant, right, the, the complexity of rationality, there is all of this great, amazing research coming from different disciplines showing that rationality is actually, whatever it is, it's this kind of complex amalgamation of different things. Um, so if you, if you disable certain emotional centers in the brain, then people can't engage in long-term planning or their risk yeah. evaluations get messed up. This, like the famous example of this is Phineas Gage, mm -hmm. the railway worker who in the 19th century had a railroad spike through his eye and like he, he walked away from it and kept on living and sort of doing stuff, but slowly his, his ability to maintain relationships, form long-term plans and sort of think clearly over time broke down, but it was his emotional center that was um, disabled. So there is, I totally agree that um, we do need a more complicated understanding of rationality. Yeah. And um, you know, my worry is in some sense that the conventional things that people say to progressive activists are not really sensitive to that fact. It's just like, let, you know, what is the model? The model seems to be a college style seminar debate or something. Um, maybe that's unfair. I, I'm really critiquing myself, you know, thinking mm -hmm. about what am I saying to these activists who don't want Peter Singer to talk. Mm -hmm. um, it's a longer story, but I think that when we think about, we think about progress in the open society, we have to embrace a model that's much more receptive to diverse forms of communication and human interaction than just arguing and reasoning with each other, right? Mm -hmm. um, vigorous, forceful protest, emotional displays, um, certain forms of coercion even are an important part of the whole thing. Yeah. Neil Young. Yeah, this, I'm glad you brought that up because I think, I mean, I'm curious what other people think. Of course, Neil Young, Neil Young is not pulling the plug on Spotify. But he's very clearly using his power to try to silence certain people, right? Or, or to, at least to take away a big megaphone that they have. And that, I think, is pre, a pretty clear example of social, social coercion that's like a no-no in, in the open society playbook now, <laughs> right? And I guess maybe it's not, but it does raise the question of how do we think about that? So you can't be Vladimir Putin. You can't be like, I'll kill you if you say X. That clearly is not consistent with the open society. 
or I'll imprison you. Okay, no, you can't do that. Or I'll make a law that says you can only use these words. Okay. But then there's this whole spectrum of cases. What counts as illegitimate protest and what counts as sort of inappropriate social coercion? I think we're not so clear about this. Like Twitter mobbing, is that against the open society or that's part of the open society? Because everybody's just exercising their right to free speech. If someone says something, they should be ready to take harsh criticism. Um, so, to me, it's, it's a little, um, it's a, these examples are complicated, but there's definitely some coercion in it, even if it's not the distilled version of cancel culture. Big tech um, undermining both principles. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about this when you were talking. What do I think about big tech? Because on the one hand, there are all these new social capacities that they have created for communication. And again, there are some great social scientists kind of deploying those capacities to, to help, pointing to Michael over there, running e-town halls and so on, like using these, these new technologies and capacities to, I think, do something that an open society liberal should approve of, and that's good for progress. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, I would say, oh, the world before big tech was a much more Walter Cronkite, New York Times, gate-kept world. Like, it was just much harder for let's ordinary people, quote unquote, to, to say stuff and, and participate in the public forum. Um, now, the problem, of course, is that there's such a concentration of power. And that's very worrying. On the other hand, it's a counterweight to the government. So to me, it's all very complicated. I'm, I'm not, I don't, for me, it's not obvious that, I don't think I've gone as far as you have in terms of like casting big tech as, I don't know, maybe evil is not the right word, but like this mortal threat. I'm, I find it, it's a messier question. Oh, I do too. Yeah. I mean, I could elaborate on why, but right, I'm right. just tossing it out there. To sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so should I say some things? Should I go in the comment direction now from the response, or do you want to jump in? And I, I don't want to monopolize, I want to control the mic here. Um, so. I know, Mike, go ahead and if you just yeah, briefly say something. Sure, and then okay, we'll... I'll focus on one thing. Um, I mean, thanks for bringing up that all that sort of anthropological stuff at the end. That was really cool and um, thought-provoking. I guess, you know, my reflexive reaction is that you can have egalitarianism in an open society without markets, so long as you're a small society. A small and intimate society can do that. Yeah. Um, and that markets are in some sense a response to kind of large scale impersonal relationships. So you need markets and you need kind of formal private institutions of private property to solve production and distribution problems when you can't get together in the town square mm -hmm. amongst your kin and and loved ones or people you know well and just kind of work it out. So th that's that's just a reflexive response. But mm -hmm. my feeling is that the, the paradigm of the open society, while it, it may not be a purely uh, European innovation, is, is a response to kind of the way that um, economic activity and political activity sort of scaled up mm -hmm. um, after the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. Great. All right, I'll stop there. Yeah. Super, well thanks. So um, I just wanna take a few minutes and then uh, turn it over to questions from the audience. And in these few minutes, I, I really what I wanna do is just basically invite you to say a little bit more about uh, the, the sort of the value of openness itself. Like when we talk about open society, not to zero in too much just on a, on a term, but like what is it that's important about open society that we need, that we wanna to try to maintain? So whether we're talking about market societies or non-market societies, what is this? common thing of kind of an open society that is is really so important that we need to keep our eyes on. Um, and then I want to ask you a little bit more about sort of, yeah, so what are the, what then do we really think are some of the mechanisms that are required to maintain it? And so um, I guess with regard to the first one, I, you know, I wasn't sure anyone was going to say anything about uh, Karl Popper in, the, in, this, in, in this event. Um, I've done some, some work on, on Popper and I'm interested in, in his views, so I was interested to hear that. And, and I, would, I would just say, you know, uh, 
he, you know, his concern was about closed societies, right? And so what, what is a closed society? Well, a closed society roughly is a society where people's sort of ideals are set, the institutions are set, and people's minds are set, yep. right? And then he says, but there's real dangers that come along with that, uh, and, and we can understand them in a variety of ways, um, uh, uh, sort of what sort of the causal factors are. But he says, but we'd rather live in this kind of open society, this sort of pluralistic society um, with many of the freedoms that we're familiar with, and, and also kind of core, I think, egalitarian commitments. And then what he says, right, what he's worried about is that in a society like a more pluralistic society, there's this thing called the strain of civilization, he calls it, right? It's, there's, we're all, people are always getting pulled back to sort of the more closed ways of thinking because it's hard psychologically to live in a more pluralistic society. And, and uh, so the reason I'm going on about this is I feel like what he proposed was the importance then of developing a kind of tradition of what he called reasonableness, uh, 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 which wasn't, I think, a kind of hyper-rationalism, but was just a sort of commitment to, um, uh, uh, appreci to, to the idea that you might be wrong and that it's important to that your that your commit your commitment to justice is not necessarily the same thing as your commitment to your current conception of justice. That it's important to hear from others and 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 be open uh, to the possibility of being wrong, and 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 that that kind of openness. So then, instead of having um, set ideals and set institutions and set minds, what you have is ideals to some extent remain open, institutions to some extent remain open and minds need to remain open. And so that's kind of the way I think, sort of, sort of like in a canned way, what I think the, the Popper project is. And then the, the challenge is, well, this tradition of reasonableness that's supposed to sort of help us sustain kind of the pluralistic society. Well, how do you do that in a way that's truly consistent with having an open society? Because it seems like you are going to maybe making some judgments about who can, who, who's sort of appropriately reasonable or who's not appropriately reasonable, right? Who's actually uh, a part of the game? Uh, you know, and also what is it to be appropriately responsive to evidence and things like that? There's gonna be all these questions that come in about that. And I feel like the value to me of Popper right now is that we do see these real challenges for democracy in terms of just even the evaluation of evidence, populist movements. And it doesn't seem like there is a shared tradition of reasonableness and, um, and, and I think that the, you know, so then the question would, is that even possible to do in a way that's consistent with the ideals themselves of, of, of openness? Um, and if we don't, if we can't have a kind of tradition like that, then how do you maintain open society? Um, just to, I guess, finish, I, I know I'm kind of going on about things, but I mean, you know, some people will say, well, markets are the key, right, to come back to that point. The markets are uniquely able to coordinate among differing perspectives in a kind of non-coercive, non-authoritarian way. And that's sort of the, the, the magic of the markets is that they can maintain open society without having to introduce, say, some tradition, even a thin tradition of kind of reasonableness the way Popper wanted. But certainly you wouldn't have to be, be sort of introducing sort of thicker kinds of uh, maybe more controversial ideas. And so I guess I just wonder, I mean, with all of that setup is both you know, when you're thinking about the openness that's important to maintain, and you're thinking, for instance, about the role of markets in all of that, and you've already said some things about this, like how, 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 you know, what are the mechanisms that we should be focusing on um, for the sake of protecting open society? Mm -hmm. Can I go first? Go ahead, yeah. I should go first? Oh, okay. sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, okay, you can go first. Okay. Go first. Do I have well-formed thoughts on this topic is a question. Let, let me, um, so on the idea of open minds situations, open minds institutions ideas, um, I do wonder, Piers, what, is there a further, can you ask a further question than, okay, then why is that good, right? Like, what's the fundamental thing? And for me, um, and I, I think for the people in this tradition, there's sort of two fundamental goods. One is freedom. Freedom is intrinsically valuable, and the open society is a freedom-protecting society. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is that the open society promotes um, innovations which make human lives go better, broadly speaking. So 
that's how I think me and you know I, I am not a popper guy right but I kind of I think of popper as someone right he's, he's drawing the analogy with science we're going to make progress we're going to falsify but that's because human lives get better um, so freedom and the bettering of the human condition mm -hmm. and that's why the open society that's the answer I would give um, it's maybe it's too simple an answer now as far as uh, prescriptions to promote that I mean my comments reflect some of my own internal sense of, of conflict about this. Um, I guess I'll just say one thing, which is that I think probably any healthy version of the open society is one that, where there's going to be many different spheres of contestation that will take different forms. And there's a certain kind of division of labor. So I think we do need to have events like this maybe universities in particular are the site of a certain kind of rationalist paradigm of discourse. We sit down, we talk, we present evidence in a certain way, we don't shout at each other. Mm -hmm. But that there are going to be many other spheres that look pretty different. And the, the problem with any conception of reasonableness that's too narrow is that it then beca becomes a kind of exclusionary principle. Right, and it almost gets back to that, that contractarian thing we were talking yeah, about. Like, yeah. well, who's the reasonable people? They're the ones in the contract. You're, you're unreasonable. Yeah, yeah. Like, we're not listening to you. Yeah, exactly. Um, OK. Yeah, I'll pass good. the baton. No, that's good. Yeah, this is really thought provoking. Um, and I guess what I'm wondering is, how should I even put this? Um, Maybe I'll start with the point about uh, social coercion being potentially at odds with the open society. I have no problem with social coercion uh, in an open society, uh, as long as it's fact-based. In, in other words, people are open to being proven wrong in their beliefs. And that's, I think, the thing that is lacking these, these, these um, coercive forms of, of uh, uh, you know, canceling people. And you just see it just develop just like a virus on social media with people not even really thinking. They just see other people are doing it and they follow along. Well, that has nothing to do with an open society, right? And that starts to amount to genuine coercion. But I think, practically speaking, we could make a viable distinction between social coercion um, and real coercion, when it shades into real coercion. So for, in that view, say, take the Charles Murray incident in Middlebury College. Yeah. You know, you might not be familiar with this, but uh, I was injured in an event in Middlebury College because I agreed to moderate uh, uh, an event with Charles Murray, even though I disagree with them, just to try to have a reasonable um, discussion and you know so strong social co coercion developed because everybody became an expert nobody read Charles Murray but everybody read some website that said he was a white nationalist and it went from there but people weren't thinking there was mem there were members of the faculty just saying that they knew that this was the right position to take without having read a word he had said and it was that was very dis disturbing to me but in some sense, you can't stop people from doing that. You know, you can just try to make them aware that that's what they're doing, and that's our job as educators, to teach people to think for themselves. You have stopped thinking for yourself. Uh, but you have to permit that in a free society. You, you just have to permit that. But what you can prohibit is like injuring the person uh, from, who, who agreed to take a controversial position or moderate a controversial panel. And you can, you can definitely make sure you stop people losing their jobs over a stupid tweet. I mean, this, is, this has reached the point of ridiculousness, right? Where social coercion is so powerful that people are actually willing to engage in a Maoist-style struggle session in public offering their apologies for some mindless comment, um, which I would think that we would be able to say, just apologize for it and move on. But it, it's gone much further. So we could, if we could, that would be my practical 
bit of advice is you can't stop social coercion. In some ways, it can be really positive. There's a lot of social coercion going on now against Russia. I think that's a great thing in defense of the open society. But you can stop this sort of intolerant uh, coercion that's policing speech and, and behavior. Um, that, I think, could be done. And I guess the core value I would emphasize there is empathy, right? Really ideological people are not empathizing with people who disagree with them. And if we could all just be a little bit more empathetic about our fellow humans, we can embrace the plurality, which is at the heart of open society. You know, we didn't talk that much about pluralism, but that's really at the heart of it, right? In an open society, there are all these people who disagree. And the main thing that you insist on in science is that something can be falsifiable. Well, if you look around today, the sorts of positions some people are taking, there are beliefs that are equivalent to religious beliefs. They are unfalsifiable. They are just true. And I have come to the conclusion myself that there are some people you just need to write off. Nothing you say to them is ever going to be uh, persuade them otherwise, because this has become such an important core part of their identity, this set of beliefs. But there are also a lot of decent people out there, which when you point out that this is what's going on, they realize they don't want to be part of it. And I think that's most of America, actually. I think a lot of ordinary Americans are sick of this polarized political landscape that we're forced to accept. And we can do something as individuals to stop that. Just by insisting, you know, go take someone to coffee with whom you disagree. Uh, you know, refuse to engage in ad hominem attacks on people. Assume the best in them until proven otherwise. This might sound naive and idealistic, but I think those are core values in an open society that have perhaps been underemphasized. And that, that really speaks Don't to the kind there. of tradition I think I was talking about. It's yeah. like, so I think we, 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 we are able to point to cases that we think are problematic. I think it's a little bit harder than, we, though you just started to do it, yeah. to pivot and say, well, what's the positive set of values that we're identifying with open society that we want to believe that lots of people could actually buy into, yeah. um, uh, even across great differences, to say, this is how we would like to operate in, uh, together mm -hmm. in order to avoid um, certain kinds of very, say, bad outcomes or... or yeah, um, yeah. Or, Middlebury has just, uh, you know, interestingly enough, come up with this, <laughs> this phrase to capture what I think is really an open society. But, you know, if this is a way to bring people to agree who've been warring, that's great. Mm -hmm. It's called conflict transformation. Okay? Yeah. That's their buzzword. Yeah. And, I don't really know what that means because it's not systematically defined, but I'll take it. You know what I mean? So, so that's where I'm at. Great. Well, with that, let's uh, turn. To, uh, we have some time for questions in the audience. If anybody has or comment, uh, anybody has. I have a um, microphone with a very long cord. I've been told. Well, how long? Not very long. Henry, why don't you come on up and, and, on up. and yeah. use the microphone? First thing, thanks everybody for, the, uh, for that excellent panel. Here's my question. So one of uh, Karl Popper's students, George Soros, famously said in an interview that uh, Popper, qua scientist and philosopher, was too interested in the truth. Like he gave it a place that in the real, life, in the real world it doesn't have. So what that made me think about is that a lot of journalists that were covering the Trump rallies wrote about how the, a lot of the crowds seemed to be in on the joke and knew that, didn't necessarily believe that the things that Donald Trump was saying, but they knew what he was doing was getting the, uh, the press and us as liberal academics rattled up. And they were going along with, the, uh, with that. So I think that poses a challenge to that. Uh, uh, I really like, like the idea that we, uh, the model, uh, the seminar, maybe the graduate, even, a graduate school seminar where everybody's talking and being respectful to each other and, and putting their ideas out there. There's people that will never enter that scene, and I have my own thoughts of, as to why that is, but I wanted to, I wanted to post that to, to, to you both. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great observation. Of course, I would say that, I mean, if we, if we think about the Trump rallies, 
I'm not sure it's that the people didn't care about the truth. It's just that they're just doing something fun, right? <laughs> like they, you know, when you, if you go to the football game, maybe you don't care about the truth. And that's why we can all scream about a pass interference call. And we recognize, like, if lives were actually on the line, we would have a different attitude towards what we're saying, right? If something were really at stake, we would care about the truth. But we realize it's just a stupid football game, so we can go crazy. And I, you know, Trump rallies are like that. It's like professional wrestling. Like, let's just go a rock concert. But then those people will go home, and they're still going to vote, right? And then they're going to they're going to vote for something that maybe harms other people, or then they're going to like vote for a man who seems prepared to completely disembowel American democracy for the sake of I don't know what. And so I think right, it makes perfect sense to say that much of the time people don't really care about the truth or serious inquiry. And, and, and we as people who spend our lives thinking about this stuff shouldn't sort of overplay its role in everyday life. Um, on the other hand, if we make too much of a concession there, then we're, I think, really in some kind of like POMO dystopia where <laughs> is climate change real? I don't know. Like people disagree, whatever. That I think is very dangerous. And um, I think Trump has really been a master of kind of shepherding people towards that condition where truth just doesn't matter. And the result of that, I think, is quite dangerous, actually. I, I, to I totally agree with you, and that's an excellent observation. I'm thinking here that, um, you know, you really can't have science without the fact-value distinction, right? And fact-value distinctions are hard, but they can be made. I mean, I could probably get a, through consensus, I mean, I could probably get a consensus that this is a wooden table that is round. It, you know, and no one in this room is going to disagree with me that this isn't a wooden table that is brown. They might say some other thing about its characteristics, but they're not going to say, absolutely not, that that wooden table is purple. So there are facts. I just wonder to a certain extent, and I see a lot of this distortion of the discourse about science. We are not doing a very good job of educating people on how science works. Because science is not dogmatic. That's why I get nuts about, well, what's the science on the pandemic? Well, we don't know. You know, a lot of it we just don't know. There are, there are things we know, and there are a lot of things that are still contested that down the road we're going to have a consensus on. But science works in this, works very slowly. People have studies, and they're reporting them in the media as though they're truth. Oh, here's the science. Well, it's not the science until the consensus emerges. And maybe there's something that we can do with that, with education, in making people realize how science works. Because frankly, uh, the, the thing that makes science work is the same thing that makes the open society work, right? It's this willing to be proven wrong. Uh, uh, setting yourself up, setting up your, your thinking in such a way that it could be falsifiable. That, you know, that, that's how science works. So maybe science education is, is a key element of, of this, as well as, look, I have a lot of views on this education question. Uh, I think the, huma you know, the main problem with this generation, and I tell them this, them this directly, so it's not like I'm speaking out of school saying this, is they are completely historically ignorant. They don't know history. They have no idea how to put what they're seeing in any kind of reasonable context. And so to me, you know, the humanities is enormously important in helping to get that context. And some of the most promising initiatives, and that's what I'm working on now, are initiatives that bring, and that's what I'm hoping to do through the Open Society University Network, is bring together, you know, sciences and the humanities in a genuine conversation. But what do you need to do that? You need humanities that are non-ideological. And guess what? That's pretty hard to find now. But there are these people. In fact, the reason I'm here today is because there are people out there who think this way. And you saw this. He knows about me through an Open Society University Network um, uh, panel that we did. And 
there are a lot of like-minded, I can't, I've been invited to a number of places on the basis of that panel, because what I think that panel, what the Open Society University Network is doing is connecting like-minded people all around the world. And that's extraordinarily exciting uh, because we can have a very rich conversation. So I want to thank you for inviting me here today. In defense of the current generation, I would, <laughs> I would maybe just say that every generation is, has been ignorant of their history. You think? I, maybe. I don't know. I think um, maybe. In, or maybe our generation was ignorant of non-European subjects, yeah, right? That's, that's, that's true. Other questions? First, whoa, first of all, thank you both for this. Um, I'm just going to, yeah, you're alluding to questions about education. I think about questions of education, and both of you have talked about, at least briefly, um, your role as educators. You expressed some sort of frustration in figuring out how to navigate students who seem to be passionate about this and then wanting to, like, explain to them that the principles that they are holding are not going to be worthwhile for engaging in an open society. So I'm just wondering, how do we educate for participation? Um, given that we've problematized some of these core, like, foundational principles that seem to, like, there seems to be not a paradox there, but just a tension um, at the center of the open society. And in teaching, uh, I teach an undergraduate um, course here on philosophy of education, and my students are consistently frustrated that these ideas that we're talking about, about democracy, democratic deliberation, the role of rationality, or the role of like empathy and rationality, mm -hmm. don't seem to give them anything to work with mm -hmm. to engage in the world that they live in. So I'm wondering, do we, as educators, just continue to like, well, yeah, maybe we should complicate the idea of the Cartesian subject, and like <laughs> we should just sit with this sort of tension that we all feel, or yes, you're supposed to be rational and empathetic, it's great. But to my mind, they get frustrated that these are some sort of like pie in the sky ideals that don't give them something to work with, essentially. So I'm wondering, how, I think the core of my question is, how do we educate for participation mm -hmm. without just saying like, we'll teach tolerance, we'll teach a commitment to truth, we'll teach this sort of balanced rationality and empathy or a more ideal, like human ideal of the agent in the world. So if you have any further thoughts than what you've already shared with us, I would love to hear them. Thank you. Yeah, I have some thoughts on that. I, I mean, I think, of course, there are different spheres of life in which people get educated. But I'll speak to the university. The university is about engaging with truth as best we know it, S engaging seriously with the scholarship on a given topic. What is the cutting edge of human knowledge? And what I would say to a student looking to, to translate some of these abstract principles into real life is learn about the subject. Engage with it seriously before you show up at the protest. So I have the same experience and students are boycotting Peter Singer they're telling me, and Peter Singer says we should kill babies. And Peter Singer, <laughs> like someone emailed a set of bullet points, and that was it. Like no one had read this guy. Go read Peter Singer. Um, so in this class I teach, public affairs conversation, we choose four hot button issues. The students have to do an empirical reality project where they kind of sum up with our assistance the, the state of the debate in the empirical world on the topic, so subjects like police reform, immigration. They have to go out and interview someone they disagree with and try to get really deep inside, why does this person think what they think? And they have to do a write-up of it, sort of analyzing the disagreement. And then the culminating task of the class, they have to write a paper defending a view that they disagree with on one of these topics. Now, I'm not saying this is like the be all end all of education, but I do think that um, students need to learn, people, all of us, not just students, we need to learn about topics before we get too burrowed down in some position. And there's a lot just as university educators that we can do to promote evidence, empathy, and clear thinking 
Uh, I'd like to think those are still good, good concrete deployable skills. Yeah, they, they, they definitely are. And I think they, they definitely can be taught. And maybe uh, some examples from my two courses this fall would be useful. I, I came back to Middlebury to teach after four years of being away on leave. And I had to teach American foreign policy. And I taught a first year seminar called Democracy in America Reconsidered. And that's kind of based on the old Harvard sophomore tutorial. That's a whole other story, story how that's morphed and is part of the problem. But on reading you know, basic uh, political thinkers who influenced the American political regime. So you know, the Federalist Papers, Mill, Tocqueville. And the second half is Supreme Court cases where you actually read about the contestation about these values of liberty and equality. And so what I did in, in, in that course, the first year seminar, was I had them read all the other things they had read previously when I taught it. But I added Ibram X. Kendi stamped from the beginning, uh, a history of racist ideas in America. And they just kind of read it alongside. And so every, we were debating all the things we normally debate, these theoretical things that we were talking about. And then they'd have this. And that allowed anybody who wanted to, to continue to bang on themes about, you know, slaveholders and all these things. They're important, right? It's just there are other interesting things to talk about. And what I found happened was really interesting. You, having that alongside was just acknowledging that our history needs to be re-examined. There are things we intentionally left out for reasons um, I think that had to do with charitably speaking, keeping the country together after the Civil War. We generated some myths that have become very damaging. And they really, at a certain point, stopped talking about Kendi and started latching onto the ideas. They were, they were always open to bring it up because it was there just all the way along. But I found that that just opened them up and they really said at the end of the course, and, and that meant a lot to me, this course was, was really amazing because it, it taught me, <laughs> this is kind of funny, that things aren't black and, black and white, that, that you know, um, there's nothing that's perfect. And that's a really useful insight to have for not just for your education, but for life, as far as what you're aspiring for. And then in American foreign policy, I, I was faced with the enormous conundrum of how to teach Trump's foreign policy. Because in my personal view, he has none. So I do what, do what I always do when I have this problem. I turn to Walter Russell, Russell Mead, who's a friend from the Open Society University Network, and say, hey, how would you teach Trump's foreign policy? And he came up with this great book that we could use on conservative nationalism. And then I was able to set up a debate on whether conservative nationalism is in the interest of American foreign policy. This book is basically trying to root, I think it's wrong, but it's rooting Trump in a long tradition of a particular foreign policy perspective. I don't think these previous presidents were democracy destroying, but I tried to keep as best as I could keep that to myself. And I made the most radical students argue for conservative nationalism. I like social engineered the debates. Yeah. And that was awesome. Mm -hmm. They really were just like, wow, these people have some really good arguments. Well, that sort of made me cringe because I think he doesn't have he doesn't have <laughs> arguments, Trump. There are no arguments, but it was still a useful exercise. Just two ex two examples of things we can do that I think work. Yeah. Those those are great. We have time for just one more question. Uh, Joey? Hi there. I wanted to thank you both. This was a really interesting discussion. You both mentioned, you mentioned Donald Trump, you mentioned Joe Rogan, uh, people yeah. that I think a lot of people consider trolls in a way, people that kind of feed off of engagement that they'll say something controversial and then yeah. get a huge backlash and that almost grows their following and makes them dig in their heels. I was wondering if you thought there were ways to deal with those sorts of figures that are consistent with the open society, because you mentioned that there's tensions with, you know, deplatforming them from Twitter or from having Neil Young come out and take his music off of Spotify, right? And there's such a unique thing because if the response is just, you know, engage and, you know, argue, 
with these sorts of figures, it seems almost contradictory because that seems to just throw fuel onto the fire, right? Especially for their, you know, followers who can treat it like a religion. And so I was really wondering what you thought were like viable ways forward to approach those sorts of figures that obviously can have damaging impacts on society. Thanks. Well, I'll say this is hard. <laughs> Um, I think I tend to be more of a like empirical instrumentalist about open society principles. So I'm not an absolutist like non-coercion says X, so we must not deplatform. I'm kind of interested in what actually works so far as persuading people goes. So if it actually works to kind of pull some institutional levers that take away the megaphone, of fringe characters, I support that. Um, if it doesn't, because it just makes people more pissed off and then they dig in their heels even more, then I support not doing that. I think um, this didn't quite come up in the discussion, but I guess it, it seems something I'm taking from Allison's comments is that it's really like a, a deconcentration of power that's really crucial. So you were saying, well, yeah. I think coercion's okay as long as people um, are sort of reasonable yeah. as far as what, how, like the thought behind the coercion is reasonable. Yeah. I would say with that, the first thought is, well, that's kind of problematic because people never know if they're reasonable, right? But if you have a deconcentration of power, um, there's much more kind of leeway for that kind of behavior because there's no, there's much less of a chance that any particular player is gonna be able to kind of dominate the marketplace of ideas. Mm -hmm. So I would say in a world where there's a, we should want a world where there's pretty good deconcentration of power while at the same time, and maybe these things are not compatible, trying to pull some of these institutional levers, not in super heavy handed ways, but I think managing that information ecosystem is, is probably something we need to be doing right now. It's just the world has changed. And I think if we just let it rip, let anyone say anything all the time, it, it's, uh, it's a recipe for trouble. So it's yeah. not a very specific answer, but that's how I think about it. I, I think about it this way. And this, I would start this with saying, I've never listened to Joe Rogan. Nor have I. <laughs> so I hesitate to. I hesitate. Yeah, I hesitate to even make a comment on Joe Rogan without listening to him first, which that may sound stupid, but I really believe that's important. But one thing I would say, without having listened to Joe Rogan, is that there's a difference between Joe Rogan and Donald Trump, and the difference is that Joe Rogan, as I understand it, has a podcast that's hugely popular. Like people sit and listen to it. I can't imagine Donald Trump having a podcast. You know, what would he say that would be worth listening to without seeing him and having the spectacle and the... So maybe there's a, quali a qualitative difference there that's worthwhile. Um, I am increasingly startled by the sorts of things my son listens to. But I think it's useful because he does it. He wants to hear all the perspectives out there. And um, I don't know if Joe R Rogan is worthwhile that way. I do know that Tyler Cohen, if you know him, uh, I, you know, listen to his podcast quite regularly just because it's, it's so stimulating. He's such a smart guy, even though I think he's totally wrong about big business. Um, but, but I love Tyler Cowan. I Do love you? that podcast. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. really, really yeah, good. It's fantastic. He's so smart. But um, Cohen with a W for, for the people out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For people interested in this podcast. It's Conversations with Tyler, it's called. Yeah. I, I can't believe I'm giving an informational... Infomercial for Tyler, but All right. well, we unfortunately Ezra Klein is good too. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. All right, unfortunately, we have to call it there, but let's thank our uh, speakers so much. Yeah. The, the next session is at 11 o'clock and actually will, I think, continue some of these issues um, related to social media. And
specialist on the intersection of governance theory and information privacy law, data protection, lots of things to do with the online um, world. So I think he's really an ideal moderator. Um, and we're looking at interdisciplinary perspective about the situation of governance in this community. Um, so Thank you. Well, it is really a pleasure to be a part of a CEHV Center for Ethics and Human Values event. I am repeatedly impressed by the timeliness of the topics. I'm always interested in the topics of CEHV uh, that CEHV focuses on in these events, and I'm so delighted to be a part of one. Um, this is the panel on democracy and social media. That's hashtag democracy and social media. Please tweet about us. It's a joke. Uh -huh. Performativity. Um, <laughs> yes. um, we have a terrific panel in store for you today. Um, to my far left, your right, is Jennifer Forrestal. And uh, she is the Helen Houlihan Rigali Assistant Professor of Political Science at Loyola University in Chicago. Her research draws from the history of political thought, particularly American political thought, to investigate the consequences of digital technologies for democratic practices. And so obviously her research is right on topic uh, for today's discussion. Um, I'm not gonna go into depth on educational pedigrees of our panelists today. Um, I could go on at length if I did. But uh, I did not want to fail to point out uh, that Jennifer received her BA from The Ohio State University. So welcome back, Jennifer. Um, Michael Neblo is a professor of political science at Ohio State, as well as the founding director of the Institute for Democratic Engagement and Accountability. He's also a member of the advisory board for CEHV and serves, as, serves on the board of directors for the National Issues Forum Institute. His research focuses on deliberative democracy and political psychology. Again, highly relevant for today's discussion. Um, we're going to hear from Jennifer first and then from Michael, uh, and then uh, we will open the floor for questions and have a discussion. Um, so I want to say thanks first for everyone for organizing and inviting me to be here. I am happy to be back. Um, I think in many ways this is like a really, there's a really close connection between these two panels, so I'm excited to continue the conversation that we started um, a couple hours ago. Um, and in particular, I think Allison raised a concern earlier that struck me as like really relevant to our conversation here, that big technology has, big technologies have introduced this kind of shift in power without a corresponding way to sort of think about how to understand that. And so what I would like to do in my remarks um, is provide a kind of framework that I think we can use to understand social media, to understand sort of what they're doing right, what they're maybe not doing so well, and how we can improve to them to make them work for democracy. And in particular, how to give us the capacity for the kind of democratic contestation um, that Mike mentioned earlier. I think this means um, ensuring that they facilitate two key democratic practices. The first is, is critical inquiry, so things like deliberation, discussion, debate. The other is the kind of collective action, experimentation, um, through which we sort of do things together. And I'll just sort of spoil the ending by saying that um, my argument will be that openness is not enough, that we also need to add in social structures that encourage us to think and act not just as individuals, but also as members of the various overlapping publics or communities that we're a part of. So I have slides. I was not expecting to be the only one, but here uh, it goes. So I'll just start off by saying a little bit about the state of social media before sketching out some key aspects of this kind of social structure that I'm interested in, namely the presence of community structures. Um, and I'm going to spend the bulk of my time showing how thinking about the ways that social media organize users can explain sort of what's going on with social media and how to improve them. And then I'll sort of have some lingering thoughts on what that means. So I think it seems clear from our earlier discussion that the internet and social media in particular are promoting the values of the open society, things like pluralism and freedom, in ways that we might not have uh, imagined earlier. 
So platforms like Twitter, Reddit, and Instagram are increasing where our public officials are going to voice their opinions, make announcements, and otherwise interact with constituents with interesting implications for democratic accountability. There are also sites where historically marginalized communities and voices can gather and amplify their messages. We've seen, we've seen them successfully reshape public discourse and facilitate protests on an unprecedented scale. And because these technologies help overcome previously insurmountable barriers to communication, things like geography, these technologies also can serve as new and more diverse sort of third spaces where people can access new ideas and interact with new people and have experiences that they might not otherwise see or encounter. So far, so good. <laughs> but of course, we all know where this is going. Um, even as they make the world more open and connected, as Facebook's early mission proclaimed, maybe even because of this aim, as I'll say a little bit more about later, it's increasingly clear that social media are also revealing serious challenges for the aims and values of the open society and the practice of democracy in particular. This is not gonna be new to you, but disinformation spreads quickly and quietly through social media spaces. Twitter hosts all sorts of violent rhetoric that dissuades citizens, especially women, especially women of color, and in particular black women, from entering the public sphere and staying there. Platforms like Facebook collect massive amounts of information on their users, making it possible to survey and target people on a scale that we've never before seen. And alongside mainstream platforms like Facebook, we see sites like Discord, Reddit, 4chan, Parler, Gab, and a bunch um, of others that I don't even know exist. Um, play hosted communities like QAnon, Stop the Seal, and incels who are unwelcoming, even hostile and aggressive towards outsiders, and perhaps even destructive of democracy. And yet, <laughs> uh, these, despite these problems, digital technologies are here, uh, and they're going to stay here. Facebook has more than 2.8 billion monthly active users, that's people who sign in at least once a month. This is a population larger than any single country in the world. It's more than China and India combined. And this is why these technologies are, as the Supreme Court noted in 2017, our new public square. Walking away from them is just not an option. And so the question we're left with is, I think, how can we prevent the disinformation, polarization, hate, and extremism that these technologies seem to exacerbate without losing the valuable ways that they also help to facilitate democratic practices of contestation um, and critique? So focusing on the ways that social media platforms structure user relationships can help, I think, to not only explain why we see such dramatic differences in how social media are used, both for good and for ill, but can also help us identify strategies for improving these platforms, again, for, for democracy. So social structure is important as a sort of key takeaway here. The question is, what kind of relationships are required to make democracy work? Um, a, a big part of democratic politics um, consists in these practices of deliberation, discussion, critique, and debate, so this kind of critical inquiry part that we talked a lot about last session, as well as the kind of experimentation, decision-making, and collective action that sort of when you take these two pieces together, I think allow us to identify and work through sort of problems with others without resorting to violence. It, was, it allows us to participate in the kind of sort of contestation, again, that Mike mentioned as a principle um, of democracy. There's a lot to say about the conditions required to engage in these practices, so there's more than what I'm gonna sketch here. But I do wanna highlight the importance of the underlying social structure to making this work. There's a set of social relations that are required to actively, actively engage in these kinds of, of processes. Notable among them is that we can't do democracy by ourselves. These are collective processes of inquiry and action. So while we absolutely need things like openness and plurality to be able to engage in critique and collaboration, we also need some closure. No, uh, and especially we need to be able to recognize our connections with other people, the shared interests and obligations that arise because of those entanglements. Recognizing these shared interests and the shared norms, which again, we, we I think are important and we didn't really talk about last session and I hope we do this time, um, is what makes it possible to deliberate and act with other people. So in order to engage these democratic practices, we need structures that gather us together, that help kind of flip the switch in our brains, that makes us think about what we share with other people, sort of filter information through those shared interests and shared norms, and then figure out what to do um, and empower us to act together to do it. So we talked a little bit about in the break um, about how like physical spaces like can do that work. Um, so can traditional social structures, things like family, class, the church, these all do this, they organize people in ways that make their shared interests salient. 
They help people situate themselves within wider society and sort of find the publics or communities that they're part of. Likewise, uh, certain offline civil society institutions can also provide the sense of community. Notably, they can sort of remain flexible while doing so in ways that maybe traditional social structures can't. These kinds of organizations can help us recognize our membership in various overlapping publics, highlight our shared interests, our shared fate, while also allowing room for critique and change. But while we figured this out, I think in traditional physical spaces and traditional civil society organizations, we haven't yet given much thought to how social media fit into this equation. But if we want social media to support democracy, we need to think about whether they're built to facilitate these kinds of social relationships required for communal practices of critical inquiry and collective action. So what does this mean for social media? <laughs> social media have granted us unparalleled access to information of all kinds. And they've actually given us a bunch of freedom um, and control over that information, over what we choose to see and what and who we choose not to see. Facebook and Twitter, for example, allow users to mute, block, and unfollow both people and ideas. So we can opt in and out of seeing things with relative ease. Um, it's pretty easy to go through these few steps um, to make things disappear. This comes with trade-offs that we can certainly talk about, but what I wanna highlight is like the choice is present. Um, in fact, actually, uh, as much as we might like to blame social media algorithms for creating filter bubbles and things like it, it turns out um, that it's actually users who are choosing not to see most of the stuff um, that they don't want to. So the filtering uh, happens at that top. <laughs> so again, we can talk a lot about that, but I think the problem that I want to emphasize is that um, is one that derives from the fact that many social media platforms are organized around individual choices. The community context upon which democratic inquiry and experimentation depends is essentially missing from many of these platforms. There is, in effect, too much, or, uh, too much openness and too much disorganization. And this imbalance, while it affords personal choice, perhaps even personal freedoms, makes it really difficult to engage in the kind of democratic practices of critical inquiry and collaboration. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about each one of those um, and show you some examples. So we see a lot of content online. This is a selection from my Twitter feed and my Facebook feed from yesterday. Um, it can be really difficult to make sense of everything that we see, right? Like these feeds tend to just be kind of a fire hose of information um, that can be not just paralyzing, but pretty alienating. So um, I don't know if you can read this, but essentially like there's just posts that have nothing to do with one another. They're just sort of aggregated and thrown at the user. Um, and Twitter famously has like a really difficult time holding on to users because it's so hard to understand what's happening on the platform if you're not well versed in it. <laughs> this kind of alienating effect is due in part, I want to argue, to the lack of community on many social media platforms. The extreme personalization of these platforms, the fact that they are organized around my individual user interests, actually works to isolate us from the publics that we're a part of and they end up obscuring their connections to other people. So while I might have these sort of individual relationships that show up in my Facebook feed, there is no sense of community. The result is that while you get a lot of information, you lack a kind of shared purpose, shared interests, shared norms that make deliberation possible. So while social media might help to create publics, to borrow Dewey's language for a minute, they might set the stage for this kind of more democracy um, these publics also remain latent on many of these platforms, which makes it difficult to fulfill this promise. <laughs> so consider the case of ads on Facebook. So we all see ads. This is an ad again that I got from Etsy. Um, but we don't have a sense of who else sees the ads that we do. Uh, so this is the thing that you're looking at now is like what happens when you click on why am I seeing this ad on Facebook? This is what it tells you. Um, so Facebook ads signal that we're part of publics on Facebook, right? We're part of groups with shared interests, all of whom are being affected by Facebook's advertising choices. Facebook is telling me that I'm part of these three groups. The first one is the most concerning. It means that um, they got my name from some list of personal information. <laughs> um, and uh, the problem is that I have a, no sense of who else is in that group or how I'm related to them, right? There's just like, I have this, characteristic about myself that is obviously shared with others, it's a list, um, but nothing beyond that. This makes deliberation about Facebook ads or about this hashed list uh, really difficult, if not impossible, to deliberate about. It's really hard to talk to people if you don't know who they are. This is 
true not just of ads. We can't actually really ever see who else sees the things we do on many of these platforms or even who we're talking to at any given time. So again, this is a standard Facebook post. Um, you have no idea who's looking at that unless they leave a signal that they have liked it or something. And on Twitter, even for your own posts, like this is a tweet that I had, you can see that people are looking at it, but I have no sense of who those people are. So while these social media platforms do help facilitate the creation of publics, in other words, right, publics that I would argue should be engaging in critical inquiry about their shared interests, they're also, these platforms are ensuring that the publics remain latent, um, though advertisers can see them. So instead, users are sort of led to feel isolated, left on their own, and perhaps even alienated by the experience. Um, and this leads us, I think, to the second and probably even more pressing problem. The sense of isolation and sort of overwhelm, the alienation that this can lead to for users also trains us to be passive in these environments, to sort of give up entirely on the kind of collective action that social media might otherwise enable. And again, this should make sense to us um, if we can't find the people in our publics, if we don't even recognize that we are a part of publics or which ones we're a part of, it's really, really hard to act in concert with them. And so we don't. <laughs> Uh, instead, what happens is that we tend to cede decision-making power to other entities. Instead, we let companies like Facebook make decisions that radically reshape our lived experiences, both on and offline. Sometimes we complain about it. Uh, most of the time, we don't. But in either event, we don't really see the kind of collective action um, that would make this change. <clears throat> and this, I would argue, is not democracy, but it is domination. The key point here that I want to emphasize is that this is the result, this kind of domination situation, is not a problem or not only a problem of corporate control. It's also not or not only a problem of algorithms, of data collection and transparency, or whatever sort of technical dimension you want to focus on. <clears throat> Instead, this is a problem with the way that social media platforms often isolate and individualize us as users. It's a problem with the underlying social structure of the platforms and the lack of community on them. So as a result of the ways that social media platforms are designed, in other words, in this kind of radically individualized way, we're essentially trained to be passive consumers of information rather than sort of active Democrats. So while we might encounter plurality and difference, we might have freedom of choice and expression, we're likely going to have no idea what to do with those things, and we'll actually opt out altogether of the kind of collective power of self-determination. Which is a super bummer, but <laughs> Uh, is not the inevitable result of these technologies. Because, as we should all know, social structures can be altered. And these actually can be altered easier than others. Happily, too, there are models of social media platforms that provide us guides for how to do this kind of work. Wikipedia, for example, is built in a way that facilitates the recognition of community. Uh, it situates individual editors who call themselves Wikipedians, which already sort of signals to you that they know they share something in common. <clears throat> Um, but they're sort of situated in a social structure that helps them process information in productive and collaborative ways. Um, if you go to a Wikipedia page, um, there's always going to be a talk page up at the top. So this is the one for OSU. Um, it has a bunch of stuff, and they're really interesting, and you should look at them. But they have a lot of debates about what's going on on the article page. So the OSU page is hilariously about whether the the should be on um, the official wiki page. <laughs> Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a very long debate with multiple entries on it, um, which is hilarious. But the result of this structure, I would argue, like many others would argue, is that Wikipedia is a two-decade-long success story of not just critical inquiry, but also the production and maintenance of a public good. So that's great. Also, I think the social structure can lead to more traditional forms of collective action as well. On Reddit, where subreddits also help users situate themselves in particular communities, so again, this is um, the grilled cheese subreddit, which is quite active, and also the political philosophy subreddit, which is not so active. <laughs> um, these subreddits help, uh, they, so they, they give us a sense of community, even though users still, within these contexts, get to control what they see um, and, and interact with. But the result is that we see Redditors engage in all kinds of collective action. So they organize in response to state policies and proposed regulations. They respond to Reddit's own corporate governance um, or the lack thereof, and they do this a lot um, and successfully. And they also mobilize to collectively manage both inter and intra subreddit conflicts. So they have a lot of sort of user to user kind of conflicts that get managed this way. 
but also user to moderator. So again, sort of pushing back on um, power structures uh, that sort of structure the platform. Um, so that's also great, right? I don't wanna say that these, this means that these platforms are perfect. Certainly there's a lot of problems both with Wikipedia and with Reddit. Um, but, and I also don't think that this means that Reddit and Wikipedia are, are the only models or even perhaps the best possible models for how we might redesign platforms to facilitate democracy. But I do think that they give us a sense of what to look for um, when we are doing this. And they also suggest other kinds of interventions like things like hashtags and Facebook groups that might be able to inject this kind of community structure into otherwise open and individualized environments. What all of these have in common, and again, I think the thing that we should take away from them is that they're designed in ways that facilitate the kind of social relationships that ground democracy. These platforms provide users with access to more and different information. They empower those users to do more within that information landscape. But importantly, because they situate those same users within the clearly defined community structures, they also facilitate the kind of collective power that marks democratic politics. So uh, what does this mean? Um, I don't necessarily think it's surprising that social media aren't currently designed to facilitate democracy, um, especially bigger platforms. The lofty sort of rhetoric aside from the founders, uh, there's pretty, I think, compelling evidence that they're totally unprepared for the role that they are playing in society today. Um, but they're not necessarily the ones that need to stay in charge if they are right now. These technologies are part of the social landscape. They're already changing the ways that we interact with the world and one another. And so I think that the thing that we have to do um, as users, as citizens, is to make sure that, that they reshape the world in ways um, that are guided by the principles of democracy. I don't necessarily think this means that we need wholly new platforms, though we might. I also don't think that this necessarily means that we have to change the profit structures or profit models that we're working within, though it might. Um, but what it does mean is that we need to design platforms that help us recognize and act as members of communities. So I will leave it there, and maybe Mike will tell us how to do that. <laughs> I just jump in? Uh, okay, great. Well, um, thanks so much uh, for uh, uh, inviting me to be on the panel and all of you for taking the time to come here and anybody out there uh, in the virtual world. Um, uh, it's really wonderful to be on this panel with my colleague, uh, Dennis Hirsch, and my former student, um, Jenny Forstall. And it's particularly gratifying to engage Professor Forstall as Professor Forstall. <laughs> a colleague, and indeed a colleague whose expertise vastly exceeds mine on the topic we're discussing. And just as an odd little thing, it, I can get in this strange echo of the joy the first time my daughter beat me at chest ever after having taught her the game. And so um, it's, a, it's a strange but gratifying phenomenon. Um, okay, so um, I am going to, I, I ex, uh, uh, partially extemporize a fair bit in light of the last panel and uh, Jenny's comments. It's one of the benefits and burdens of, of going last here. Um, and, and partly I'm going to do that because especially the last panel um, touches on several key issues in my own research agenda. Um, I'm, I, I hope, uh, I'm doing this quickly, so I haven't been able to check myself. Uh, I hope it's not self-indulgent uh, to mention uh, my own research, and I'll try not to make this about the collected works of Michael Nedlo, but um, <laughs> Uh, uh, but, but I do want to discuss uh, um, some things that, uh, some work that I've done myself that I think speaks to um, some of these questions. I'm going to start out um, really responding very directly to some of the things from the last panel and Jenny's comments, and then go back and talk a little bit more about the things that I was prepared to do. Also, what is the target for our time on this? 15? Okay. Okay, great. Um, so both of the previous uh, panelists um, talked about reason versus emotion and the need for a better model of deliberating subjects and deliberating communities. Um, so first example of, of shameless plug, I have a recent APSR article on the role of emotion in deliberative theory. And the big, uh, the, the, the simple punch there is to say, um, that, that there's been an understanding, a misunderstanding generated here based on ordin the ordinary language connotations of emotion being the antonym of reason. Um, for Habermas and other deliberative Democrats, the antonym of reason is unlegitimated power. 
emotion in itself can serve reason in this sense, or it can subvert reason in this sense. Um, and the question is how to um, you know, channel our emotional uh, processes uh, in ways that serve um, uh, the, the legitimation and rationalization of, of power. Um, uh, also, uh, Mike mentioned um, you know, um, the torrent of scholarship documenting irrationality uh, of the US public. Um, and this is a bit of a hobby horse of mine. I, I have a book uh, uh, on this uh, and some working paper, papers. And you know, the general thought, I, my general perspective is that um, this literature is uh, either over or misinterpreted in a lot of cases and the situation isn't nearly so dire or perhaps better, we really just don't know in a lot of cases um, when we think we know. Um, and I'll give you a few e examples, but the big takeaway is, you, you, Mike said, we are tribal partisan motivated reasoners, right? From my perspective, the question should be, shouldn't be, are we or aren't we? That's not the debate, um, or, or the most constructive way to frame the debate for me. For me, the most constructive debate is to say, under what conditions do we behave as tribal partisan motivated reasoners and compared to what other viable conditions? Right? That's really what my, my research agenda is about, at least the empirical research agenda, and to some extent, the theoretical um, research agenda. Um, and my own sense of that is that in a lot of cases, um, the, uh, we're, we're, these results, these terrible results, seemingly terrible results, and in some cases actually terrible results, are, are surprisingly fragile to status quo conditions um, versus institutional tweaks. Um, and that it's not as extraordinary as carefully managed conditions. Um, sometimes it's, it's really just pulling a random sample or priming people um, to, to put their hats as citizens on rather than consumers of protest politics. Um, li literally, just um, one sentence primes um, can really radically transform uh, deliberative dynamics. It's surprisingly fragile in my view. Um, real quick aside, my colleague Tom Wood um, has largely debunked the backlash effect literature um, and others have really undermined Aiken and Bartels. There's, there's, just, there's a very powerful counterstream of social science on this. Um, on motivated reasoning, again, this is something I have a paper on, um, but as a, we've got a lot of pragmatists in the room and the way I often put this is from a pragmatic perspective, what reasoning isn't motivated? Right? Um, and then the question is, what are the motivations? And I get that. But I would point out uh, some of my stuff is that when we think about reasoning in our larger belief network, that consistency is eminently rational. And things that look like motivated reasoning, the way it gets operationalized in the political psychology literature, is utterly sensible. Um, take, for example, a paper published a few years back on the efficacy of remote prayer. Um, psychologists resisted that mightily, even though it appeared in a high quality journal. I'd like to suggest it wasn't crazy for them to resist it mightily because it contradicted an entire structure of their belief network and that consistency um, uh, is, an, you know, is a, a, a very uh, important uh, criterion of, of, rationalities, of rationality. Two other quick things and then I'll pivot to the bigger stuff. Um, a lot of these studies also, I think, find in statistical terms effects, meaning there's um, bias towards things that you um, uh, believed before in the sense of motivated reasoning, right? I've done some preliminary experiments where I turn that around, right? Um, the question isn't, are, is there bias? Like compared to what? We're, we're biased on all kinds of things, right? And look to see if there's an effect of responsiveness to factual information. And it turns out the effect size sometimes is four to seven times bigger than the effect size associated with our prior beliefs and motivated reasoning, right? So we've got to keep things in perspective in terms of you know, throwing rationality out the window because we find moderate deviations um, from rationality. Similar to, uh, similarly, um, I have another paper on the emotions and Jonathan Haidt, you know, showing that emotions, the, the, the rationality is the junior partner 
And the analogy I make there is um, like a ship's captain, right? Well, really, it's the navigator in terms of frequency who's making all the course corrections. But that doesn't mean that the ship's captain isn't powerfully determining the direction of, of the ship, right? And the, sort of the legacy, the, the, the genetic inheritance of rationality is sometimes embedded in, in our emotional processes. Um, so those are just some examples of the larger picture that I think things aren't as bleak as we think. Um, and that might sound like it was a pretty long digression on the open society and, and um, uh, digital platforms, but I think it's an important backdrop because um, a lot of the um, worry, I think, motivates a willingness to be fairly aggressive about um, regulating um, uh, social media and other platforms in light of this body of evidence that things are, are really, really bad. And I want to, I don't want to be glib. <laughs> in certain respects, things are really, really bad. Okay. Um, but in contrast, I think to all three of the other people so far today um, who have done, um, you know, on the first panel, kind of a lot of deep theorizing and, and Jenny moves back and forth between deep theorizing and big reform ideas, and to some extent the previous panelists did as well. I'm gonna inflect uh, my stuff a little bit differently and mostly stay within three limits. Um, one, and I wanna be cautious given my colleague Dennis Hirsch uh, here to the left, um, but one domestically is limits, at least in the short and medium run, placed by US court decisions, specifically Supreme Court decisions, but more generally and internationally by a lack of global governance, right? And I want to think about what we can do without wishing away Supreme Court precedent or um, presuming that we've got enforceable global, global governance that can manage, you know, that they can enforce things against multinational corporations, behemoths like uh, Facebook. So specifically on the court cases, I'm thinking of Brandenburg versus Ohio and free speech and U.S. v. Alvarez on punishing falsehoods, and then also retrenchment of the EU and other progress on global and transnational governance. So that's number one. The second one, in um, it, it, this goes back to, I think, one of the big think ideas from the last panel. I, I don't know if this is crazy, but I was struck on an analogy, so to speak. Um, in, in, there's, there's a kind of vagueness or, or uh, potential equivocation on the notion of openness in the open society here. Um, and the, the, the particular one I'm interested in is openness, if you will, as a comprehensive versus a political doctrine, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the aspects of op openness that get emphasized, um, I think, change between them, right? Insisting that citizens take a critical attitude towards their belief and not have religious convictions in the broad sense, I know you're not criticizing religion per se necessarily, right? Um, it, it seems to me is something like comprehensive or perfectionist um, concerns over, over openness. We want a society that's suffused um, with uh, an orientation towards openness. And of course, that's a viable thing to argue for. Um, but for purposes of digital platforms and democratic reform, I want to think of openness um, in political terms. And in particular, um, uh, um, I, I'm sorry, I, I lost my, in my sense is that Bergson and Popper, you know, feel like they're advocating for sort of a collective version of a comprehensive doctrine um, uh, to, to, to some extent. Um, let's see. Um, actually, I'm going to recur to that a little bit later, but I'm going to set it aside for now. Uh, and then the third limit I'm going to put myself in is I'm going to focus on short and medium term uh, problems um, uh, of getting from here to there, right? So incremental amelioration versus revolutionary ideas, which is not to in any way say we shouldn't be thinking in ambitious longer term uh, senses, absolutely, but that's not where I'm going to try to make my contribution here. Um, and, and part of the reason I think that's useful to do is despite the really alarming, you know, trends of democratic deconsolidation in the US, Turkey, Hungary, Poland, um, maybe Indonesia, lot, lots of places, right? Um, there's also simultaneously been an explosion uh, in democratic innovation 
um, it really practical. The Irish Citizens Assembly and Constitutional Reform, Belgium, um, Latvia, uh, um, Switzerland, Germany, France's um, uh, huge um, President uh, Macron, I'm blanking on saying it uh, properly, uh, convened giant deliberative forums, Australia, Canada. We're talking about dozens of peer democracies um, uh, if we're even peer anymore, or if that's not an invidious term, um, uh, making big consequential innovations in democracy, even as we've got this sort of deconsolidation. And so it seems to me that there are a lot of nearby reform uh, opportunities to be thinking about and doing research on. Okay. And so my, it, it, within those three uh, limits, my framework is, and, and this is speaking to um, openness as a political um, idea rather than a comprehensive notion, is that openness is designed to manage the triad, the traditional triad of states, market, the state markets and civil society. And in particular, the preconditions, as Jenny was talking about, of the political public sphere, that was 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the political public sphere as the uh, mediator and broker um, uh, b between these domains. And that's going to be important because Facebook is a, is a, you know, is a business. It's a market, uh, uh, a market um, uh, um, entity that powerfully, powerfully affects civil society and civil society's ability to channel uh, the resources of um, the, 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 the citizenry uh, back up to the state. Okay, I've misallocated my time here uh, in a lot of ways uh, because I wanted to talk about some of the projects that I've worked on that speak to this. Oh, one important thing I forgot to say at the beginning, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, my institute has recently received a fairly large gift from Facebook. It is unrestricted. I have committed to not taking money from them after five years. I'm setting up an oversight board. There's lots of backstops here, but for those of you who are uh, skeptical and, and critical uh, of some of these platforms, you should know, uh, I, in addition to accepting uh, money from them, I, I'm working with them on other uh, projects that are unremunerated. Um, but the idea is to make them more deliberative and better stewards of um, the political public sphere as it functions to mediate between the state, the markets, and civil society. Um, and uh, I can talk more about that, but in particular, I'm studying uh, that they were interested in research that I've done on democratic innovations and the different features of democratic innovation, self-selection versus random selection, bindingness versus um, just a recommend recommendation to a legislature versus putting it to a referendum. Um, uh, for government, um, and uh, I'm riffing it on governance. Uh, so imagine a giant, powerful corporation with a user base that's bigger than any country um, making uh, policy decisions that are powerfully uh, important, um, but they're not a government, um, right? They're interested in knowing um, what sorts of governance features um, people, their user base, A, would find legitimate, and uh, B, would be interested in engaging in um, themselves. Um, I gotta uh, stop there, but um, I can talk more about some of my other projects. But in general, I think the idea that the thing that we should be thinking about um, from an elite representative democracy point of view is making good politics and good government more compatible. Um, and for Facebook, the analog being good governance and good business more compatible. And that that's a more constructive way, at least in the short and medium term, uh, to think about um, uh, what our goals are. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, and Jennifer, I know we had talked about going right to questions, but I thought I would ask again, having heard Michael's remarks, is there anything you'd like to say in response before we go to questions? Um, no, I mean, I, I am sort of thinking through them still. Um, I guess I might just echo what I think is probably your optimism, that I actually, I do think that there is space for um, the kind of democratic outcomes within Facebook's profit 
model, right? Like I think there's good reasons to think that a more democratic Facebook, one with more user input, more user control, is one that users would be very excited um, to, to engage in. Uh, we just have to think about how to design it properly. So that's really interesting to hear some level of optimism from each of you, because I just, you know, I think the general feeling is not optimistic these days. Um, and I guess that raises for me questions about how do, how do we pursue that more optimistic vision as a society? Um, and when I think about this as a lawyer, I do think about the First Amendment, which really limits our government's ability to regulate at least the content of what's going on on these platforms, right? Um, ties its hands in many ways. Um, and so we have to rely, to some extent, on private governance um, it, it, to, to affect change. Um, and that brings to mind for me, um, when I think then, okay, well, what could the role of government and law and policy be? Um, the idea of reflexive law, I don't know if you've heard, you know, come across this concept, but the idea of laws that get private actors to reflect on themselves and so bring their actions more into line with social objectives. And I'm thinking of the work of, uh, Gunther Teubner, who's a theorist who, who writes about this. Um, an example in the environmental area is the toxic release inventory, which requires disclosure of information about the toxics released by companies, and that then gets picked up by the media and others, and it creates an incentive to do better. And it's been effective, actually, in reducing the release of toxics. So could we use something similar, let's say an information disclosure regime requiring information disclosure, that doesn't offend the First Amendment, to create incentives for the reduction in toxic discourse, much like we do for, for toxics. Um, what, you know, are there steps that law and policy could take to promote better self-governance by the companies, and I'll say also in response to what I, I think is one of your themes, Jennifer, by citizens, because I think you're, you're highlighting and you're foregrounding the individual's role. It's not just the algorithms, it's not just the companies, it's the choices people are making. So are there policies that we could adopt, educational or otherwise, that would create better self-governance, either by citizens or by the companies and if so, what would those be? Can I go first? Could you, uh, <laughs> if you want, are, <laughs> yeah, are you I taking do. notes? Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so yes, I think that in the short run, that's the way we got to go, mm -hmm. um, because of some of the cases. And I don't know if those cases are the, really the right ones to be citing, but right. um, uh, and here, I uh, th there's just an extraordinary book that came out uh, recently. Um, that I, I want to recommend to you um, by Congressman Ro Khanna, um, who represents chunks of Silicon Valley. Um, and Khanna is, is a fascinating guy. Um, I, for whatever it's worth, he was sort of a student of mine. He was never in a class with me, but I played a mentorship role with him when he was an undergraduate. Um, and I think he has a master's in economics and a, a, a law degree from Yale and is a, a serious intellectual, Amartya Sen, wrote the foreword, Habermas blurbed it. Um, it. It's an extraordinary book. It's called um, uh, Democracy in a Digital Age. And it's the whole thing is um, what you're talking about, mm -hmm. right? It starts from the premise that um, uh, we shouldn't and probably can't effectively take a frontal assault um, on uh, regulating speech, um, but that um, through a combination of um, reflexive law um, and carrot and stick incentivizing of the sort like, uh, you know, the, the federal government can't enforce drinking laws, but it can fund, you know, uh, highway projects such that it, it effectively, it creates enough of a carrot and a stick 
to get people to comply. So his strategy is um, uh, reflexive law and then carrots and sticks um, uh, to, um, in, in, to, to improve, to get them to improve policies, governance policies, and um, sort of engineer uh, internal policies and tweaks to the algorithm that are likely to serve public discourse. Uh, and there's also a big section in the book on spreading um, the uh, externalities of, of wealth and um, knowledge access off the coasts um, in, into the heartland and creating um, uh, enterprise zone, basically, incentives along those lines as well. It's, he's the closest thing to democracy's version of a philosopher king you're ever going to um, bump yourself into. It, it, it's really quite extraordinary. Um, yeah, so I, I will take this in maybe an unexpected direction and say that I think uh, if any role for government, the most pressing to me is strengthening protections for collective bargaining and cooperation and union unionization. Um, because I think we've seen from things like the Facebook files, we've seen increasingly from leaks um, in these companies, the walkouts and protests that employees are um, engaging in in Silicon Valley. Uh, so that we, we know that companies have some of this information. Like they know what these problems are, they know how to fix it, and they know that users would like those fixes. And so in some ways, uh, one of the sort of biggest roadblocks to this is the, the way that companies are structured to disempower all but the very top executives who are often also the founders of this company. So they have just like a, a sort of narrow perspective on what they are and what they should be and how they operate. And I think there's resources even within those companies to, to start making these changes, and I would like to see them protected. So let's open it up for questions uh, from others. Yes, in the back. Yeah, this is true, um, and certainly I'm I'm still sort of thinking about radicalization is the next thing that I'm thinking about insults and things like that. Um, so this is sort of half form, um, but I think if you actually if you look at a lot of those stories of people who get like sucked into the YouTube algorithm and end up like as QAnon conspiracy theorists, um, one uh, sort of underlying sort of factor in their descent into madness, perhaps, is that like they're just looking for answers, right? Like the, again, this is like a, a function of the fact that they, there's like a bunch of overwhelming information that we're bombarded with every day. And like Q proposes to tell us how that all makes sense and like how you should understand it and what you should do about it. Um, and I think that like a lot of the times when people are radicalized, especially when they're radicalized in these like really isolated ways on YouTube, on Facebook, whatever, um, is because they're, they lack the kind of um, community structures that would answer some of those questions or help them answer, right? So, so the last thing that you said, I think is a lot of sense, is that they're making sort of unreflective choices, but like, so we need to sort of build back in the spaces for reflection. I don't think that that's always going to be what algorithms do. I think that like there's a sort of symbiotic relationship between algorithms and users. And so sure, they filter a little bit for you, but like the reason why those get more radicalized is because like those, those experiments like have them keep clicking on things that they're shown in their feed, right? Like if you don't do anything in your feed, it's just going to stay the same. It's because you like are clicking in the things that like take you further and further down. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. 
Yes, I think that that's absolutely the case. I just don't think that that's the only way to structure platforms with even uh, even algorithmically. Like so, Reddit is algorithmically structured as well, right? Like you you are fed more information that you click on. Um, but I think because it's situated within communities, you get that information already in the context of a, of a conversation about it. And you get like lots of communities talking about maybe the same thing, but like from different perspectives. And because of that diversity, you like people don't radicalize as much on Reddit as they do on YouTube. And I think that there's good reasons for that. But uh, yeah, they're, they're absolutely structural, but I don't think they're like necessarily algorithmic. Could I real quickly uh, jump in on this too? Because um, this is another example of uh, a truth being, I, I, in my view, somewhat misinterpreted, um, which is there, there certainly is this phenomenon of ra radicalization and people going down rabbit holes and ending up in conspiracies uh, and, and you know, impenetrable uh, bubbles. Um, uh, and that's really bad. <laughs> um, but there's a fair bit of research uh, emerging suggesting that if you're looking at um, uh, it, it more or less the general population, the filter bubble thesis is heavily overstated. Um, and that you're really talking about fairly small numbers of people. Um, now, those very fairly small numbers of people have outsize, you know, they, they become heavily radicalized and then they post all over the place. And, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to trivialize it. But I do want to just kind of keep hitting this theme of a lot of media reports, and, and it's, it's, it's kind of uh, meta, right? Our attention is drawn to the spectacular examples of um, Facebook and other social media going wrong. When you, but when you look at base rates, the sky isn't falling quite as badly um, on social media. I, I think we've got really serious problems in our public discourse and our politics and all these other sorts of things. Um, but there are, but the situation isn't as intractably hopeless, in my view, um, as one might think, precisely because the reporting, your attention is drawn to the things that, that are unusual and problematic, uh, and especially problematic. But the. Um, people get exposed to much more cross-cutting information on Facebook um, than is commonly believed. That's another sort of um, uh, thing that we knew we know that isn't so. Um, you know, a, a common belief that turned out not to stand up particularly well to scrutiny. Certainly, there's a bias, but again, that's an effect versus you're in a filter bubble. People also don't uh, encounter that much cross-cutting information, as it turns out, in like their neighborhoods yeah, yeah, no, exactly. either, right? So, like, yeah. Work, right? We talk yeah. a lot about Facebook, but like people just don't really talk to people that are different than them in real life either. It's it's worse now. Yeah, yeah I think that's right. <laughs> It's heuristic. I realize that's yeah. not rigorous, but go ahead. You know, I, so I just want to ask you more about what you have in mind because I, I don't think that's so. Just you know, as somebody who spent who was too much of my career so far, like following walls down the path of like this distinction between comprehensive doctrines and, and, and political doctrines, where the idea is that maybe there's a way of accounting for political doctrines that are so thin in some way that they're like non-controversial uh, among. Um, all reasonable comprehensive doctrines, right? So this idea that you could make interventions in our collective political life that, that would be sort of recognized by all as sort of being, as being legitimate in some way. And so, uh, and then I just feel like that has a totally failed project, personally. Mm -hmm. I just feel like we've learned going down that road that uh, there is no way to have interventions um, that it are in some way going to be based on values that are at least Kind of controversial to some set of reasonable people. And so to me, I kind of felt like that's, I don't really get the distinction anymore between comprehensive and political. Um, and so I'm just curious how you are thinking of that as potentially still a useful distinction, whereas I'm thinking like we've done, I think we've identity the idea that we have to sign up for some kind of, even if it's 
fairly soon, kind of comprehensive doctrine that's going to frame what open society is. Sure, that's interesting, because I, from what I can tell, there, uh, I, I thought I had a disagreement with you, but then maybe I, I don't. Um, here's how I read Rawls on this, is, um, uh, at, I mean, yes, technically he says he's got a theory of the right, not a theory of the good, right? Um, but I think he gives back with one hand what he takes with the other, by limiting it to a reconstruction of our best self-understanding in more or less mature Western d democracies and hoping under conditions of modernity and hoping that that is applicable more broadly. To me, that's the thin conception of the good that he's just stipulating. And that within that, <coughs> he's trying to stay as neutral as possible. So, so my thought on this is that um, that that's how you would do it, that there's value in um, being as encompassing, all else equal, encompassing as, as we can. There are, are counterexamples. I don't necessarily want to be highly encompassing to white nationalists, although maybe even, you know, for free speech purposes, if we can tolerate that, perhaps we should consider it, right? But um, it's, it's one thing, um, to, I went back and looked at Bergson and a little bit of Popper, and um, Popper, is, Popper is consistently more subtle, even on like the philosophy of social science than I think he's giving credit for. There, you you, you know, probably know this better than I do. There, there are these caricature versions of Popper out there um, uh, that are based on a little knowledge, and that's a dangerous thing. Um, so I want to be careful about characterizing Popper too much along these lines, though I think I see that, that they are too. Certainly Bergson, um, you know, it, it was, uh, the, you know, who introduced the term and the concept, it, what, it had to do um, with or, organic versus um, mechanical, it's broader sociology um, of society. And it certainly, to my mind, it, there are strong resonances with um, uh, openness as um, a mechanism for managing difference, protecting pluralism, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, and openness as uh, intrinsic freedom, a good in itself, something that is the kind of life you want to live under uh, in societies under conditions of modernity. Uh, um, so, in, and as you know, Larmor makes this distinction between pluralism and reasonable disagreement, and that whether the, the the good is in fact many is one of the things that we can reasonably disagree about. And I want to sort of say that vis-a-vis um, -vis the open society, right? That, um, that, that, you know, whether we need to take a critical attitude more broadly in our lives is one thing versus um, as a model of responsible actors in the public sphere in managing the relationship between um, the state market, civil society, and the political public sphere as the conduit um, steering between those three. Um, to my mind, we should have a functionally minimalist conception of openness in order to make that triadic, the mediation of that triadic relationship work. And that's what I mean by political versus not comprehensive. But I'm happy to concede that there's a substantive, mo a, 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 a pretty substantial, well, a, a, a fairly large substantive moment to that. It's not trivial, but it seems to me to be usefully distinguishable from Popper and Bergson. Good. Thank you. That, that was super helpful. Of course, I remember it. I think Judge Miller's going to have to get pushed back on what I said. Probably I would say Popper with Wall as an author's question. And that could, you, you know him much better, and, and I prefaced it by saying he, he keeps zigging when I thought he zagged. Um, so that could well be true. Um, but let me put it this way. The, the public, the, the way Popper on the open society is often portrayed in the same way that falsificationism is often portrayed, I think has this feel of being more comprehensive, even if maybe it's more the Rawlsian um, side. I think Michael, you had a hand. Yeah, thanks. Um, I appreciate all the pushback, Michael. On, uh, <laughs> Sorry if that was uh, a bit over the top.
presentation. I think you guys kind of goofy in that a little bit, but I'll, I'll just stay in it. And, um, so one way of putting my question is, would, would QAnon and the big lie and like some of the, the crazy, the insane extent of sort of anti-vax belief in the American public, would that have happened to the internet? To what extent is that an artifact of the internet era? Because I think the conventional thought that, yeah, that's internet stuff. Because all of a sudden, all these kind of fringe people get the megaphone, and they're sort of like, frictionless social association, right? It's like somehow you can get some critical mass and then people go along to that and there's just no stopping it because there are no gatekeepers anymore, mm -hmm. right? It's just like a zoo. Um, and that just makes things really unpredictable. And so Anthony Fauci is less credible somehow than like some weirdo hoarding bottles of hydroxychloroquine in his garage, right? Doing a podcast. So, how should we think about these kinds of phenomena as a function of the internet or, or what? It's just something else that's making us go bonkers right now? Because I, I appreciate the optimism, <laughs> but I also, intuitively, it seems like the internet is driving a lot of this craziness to some new degree. I have a take on that. <laughs> Um, but if you want to go first or gather your book. Um, so so you, you said, what role does it play? The thing that I think is mistaken in the common, in, in, in the, the going understanding is that um, in statistical terms that, that there's a main effect or, or a, um, um, a valence that makes the internet bad along these lines. To my mind, you put, you, you alluded to it, it's catalytic on process. So the Mich Michigan militia was whack job QAnon before QAnon and was not caused by the internet, right? Mm -hmm. Now, um, the part where I agree with you is the, the, the internet is catalytic in being able for Michigan militias to organize without having to be confined to Michigan, right, to rural Michigan. Um, and, and if not frictionless, lowers the coefficient of friction substantially, right? Um, so, it, uh, so if, if that's what you mean, I absolutely agree and concede that. I'll even go further and say that um, there's been an uptick of, in some of this craziness, right? But um, that comes with also catalytic goods, right? Um, LGBTQ uh, youth living in, you know, um, Centerville, Ohio don't, feel like they're the only people in the world um, and can connect into networks and movements and support structures um, as well. To take an example from Facebook, um, there's a, just an inspiring, amazing person there um, that I talked to that left this NGO in Africa that was basically um, constructing and facilitating an underground railroad for women fleeing um, uh, domestic abuse, um, you know, who, who if they try to flee are often gang raped, acid attacked, or murdered, right? Um, the, the within, I, I, my number, please don't take my numbers to the bank, but in a very short period of time, within like two years, um, the number of women that were successfully shepherded to, to shelter was like septupled or something along those lines. So it catalyzed these amazingly good things too. And so, and again, my hobby horse here is not is the internet or social media good or bad. It's under what conditions does it serve social goods, whether they be um, democracy promotion, this mediating the triad through the political public sphere, or just straight up civil society stuff, um, like this Underground Railroad um, uh, network. And compared to what? We're, we're not just gonna shut down the internet, right? And what sort of near, plausible nearby worlds can we aspire to get to through viable policy reforms within the, the constraints, let's say domestically, of established First Amendment law or internationally in the lack uh, of, of global governance anytime soon, right? And to my mind, um, 
theorization. Actually, I very much support high theory on this, but then I think the next step is thinking about the second sailing, right? So you read Republic, and then what's the next best regime, right? And what does that mean, and what would we need to know empirically to identify the next best regime and tee it up maybe to get to the best regime, right? To me, and this is what I refer to at sort of a meta level, impact-inspired basic research. So the idea here isn't just a bunch of applied A-B testing. I'm not trying to socially engineer the internet or only socially engineer the internet. But it is to say that we, you know, if we waited for basic virology to stumble upon a COVID vaccine without the concept of a disease and a diagnosis of it as bad for human flourishing, we wouldn't have targeted the research in a way that would have led to remarkably fast and effective solutions, right? And that we should be structuring certainly our empirical research agenda in light of a normative analysis akin to that. So that's my basis for optimism. Or at the very least, what else are we going to do, right? What's the proper attitude if not a kind of not cautious optimism, modest optimism? It's a version of the intentional stance. We've got to assume we can do something positive here and do our best to do it and set up the preconditions for doing it effectively. So I would agree with all that. I also think that one of the distinctive things about these technologies is the mismatch that they introduce between the kind of information explosion and the sort of lack of social organization to make sense of that information. And so, you know, thinking about these groups, in some ways, I think it's like really good that we see that these groups are present and popular because they've always been present, right? And they apparently are very popular and maybe we needed to know that. But like the internet has sort of revealed not only their presence and popularity, but also removed the conditions that make norms and social sanctioning possible. And so I think to think about the conditions that Mike is referring to, one of them is to think about how to create conditions where, you know, these groups either don't exist or more likely where if they exist, they're like disempowered by social norms that make it like unacceptable to be a white supremacist in polite society, right? That like those are, but those are things that again require a certain kind of organization to achieve. So I think I have a very, I think the answer of pseudonymity is very easy. I don't think, I think people are just as invested as their pseudonymous reputations in a place like Reddit as they are in their reputations with their like quote unquote real name. Uh, the anonymity question is harder for me, but I also, I still think that there are ways of, um, so the, the anonymous, the, so the most anonymous place on the internet that I can think of is 4chan and the B board that maybe some of you know about. The B board on 4chan. It's like what created anonymous the group is because everyone is anonymous on B board. It's also where like Pepe the Frog came from, and like all of the like horrible things that are sort of horrible on Reddit are more horrible on 4chan, but they're like horrible in the same way, right? That there's still like a really distinctive identity about from this this space. They have a name for themselves that I won't 
say here because it's terrible, but like that's part of like their identity as being terrible. And so like there is kind of sanctioning that happens in that space and people want to fit in with the way that that community operates and not look like idiots by like being too good or something, um, which I think complicates the anonymity story because like, yeah, you would never know that I'm the anonymous one, two, three, four instead of anonymous four, three, two, one, but um, it's, there's still something that's operating there. And I guess I don't know necessarily, I don't have a good answer on that. Do you think it operates less well or equally? I think that reputation still operates in anonymous spaces, I think it operates differently, and I'm not quite sure okay. what the difference is. Could I, I, I'm gonna be super fast about this. Again, I, I don't wanna like bang the drum incessantly, but I have a paper that shows that anonymity defeats women not speaking up um, in social situations, um, that they participate at the same deliberative rate um, when you don't know the, the, the gender uh, of the person who's speaking. So to me, again, the question is not, is anonymity good or bad? It's when does anonymity serve the goals um, that, that you're seeking here? And are there institutional fixes to catalyze the good and tamp down the bad? Um, so. I also, so I, sorry, I guess I'm, I'm, that made me think. So I think the interesting, again, I think the, the like, way that you keep raising it, Mike, is like, you know, the interesting question is actually this other thing, not the question that everyone is asking. I'm and, sorry, that's, <laughs> which, which I think is that's legit. That's obnoxious. That, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> thank you. But, so I guess I'll do it, um, which is to say, I think the interesting question about anonymity is not about anonymity, but it's about the presence of reputational considerations uh, and when those are present and how we want them to operate, right? So uh, in a space where the norms are such that if you violate the norms, um, as a woman speaking, um, you'll get sanctioned, anonymity might be valuable because the reputational considerations are operating in a way that's like oppressive, whereas in other spaces, reputation operates to like uh, pr sort of promote this kind of like debate, pluralism, et cetera. Well, thank you. You started me on two women and you really, uh, I'm really yeah. happy how much the reputational kind of forces play over the next two dollars. Yeah. Those I think, so I think that it's, the evidence is pretty clear that people think about the same way. So Redditors are like super protective of their handles to the extent that like if they go into another subreddit where they like might be acting in a different way than their like normal subreddit, they'll, they'll change a new name because they don't want it to connect to them. So Sue, we have a few more <laughs> questions out here. Dana, did you have a question?
probably a quick question for you to think about governance with these big platforms. Uh, so the, I think the only thing that I'll say is um, I, I'm not sure that I, I, I think if the sort of flagging as inappropriate and the options that you choose, if we want to understand that as a, a form of democratic engagement, it is, I guess, but I think it's a pretty thin one, maybe akin to like voting, right? Where it's like, there, it's, it's gets you to think about things, but you have, especially on Twitter, you have no sense of like, how should we interpret inappropriate, right? Like what is the, the sort of standard of Twitter that I'm using to make this judgment? And so I think the, the, what ends up happening is like, people just end up flagging whatever they don't personally like, which is like not necessarily democratic deliberation in the sense that we might want it to be more robust. Um, so I think there are things that would need to happen to make that kind of activity, like that moderation um, to be more sort of communal and collective um, and probably more effective that way. Um, and more maybe widespread though. Um, so a lot of the lab maintenance labor um, is undertaken by women of color to moderate their communities. Um, and also even on Reddit, like the moderators uh, and people who like upvote and downvote are like a really small percentage of the population. So there is also a question of like, how many people wanna do this? Like I think it's probably larger than we currently see, but I, I, it might not be everybody. <laughs> Um, but I think, you know, there's also things that I, I think there's innovations that the companies themselves can introduce to add more user input into what the decisions they make that I think that's... Yeah, well, unlike <laughs> my last several responses, I'm not going to change the question. I'm going to say that was like a question I had never considered and is deeply interesting and important. Um, and I have nothing to add other... I, I, I would second most of it, all of what Jenny said and don't have any interesting thoughts beyond that yet. Um, but thank you, because I think it's an important question that I just haven't given any attention to. Uh, in the back first, yeah. Would you want me to? Yeah. yeah okay. Great. Um, okay. Um, so I don't think it is the public sphere. Um, I have a um, in my first book. I argue um, a lot of people think deliberative democracy means you know Jim Fishkin's deliberative opinion polls or mini publics or 
um, New England town halls. Um, to me, deliberative democracy is a theory of legitimacy, um, and uh, um, deliberativeness is properly understood as a property of the larger uh, deliberative system, so the political public sphere. Um, and so under those circumstances, um, social media play, I would say, an outsized and growing role in the larger deliberative system and a novel one, largely because of uh, its potential for disintermediation, right? Here to force a much more discourse um, uh, was channeled through mass media. Um, and there was this structural gap between the people I talked to over the water cooler or, or at church or in my family um, and, uh, you know, uh, high order public discourse reaching large, large numbers of people, right? And what, uh, what social media has done uh, for purposes of the political public sphere is created this, um, uh, filled in this large middle space and given people, at least in principle, much more access um, uh, to reach beyond their day-to-day -day physical intimates, um, it, uh, not physical intimates, mm -hmm. um, physically proximate um, uh, um, interlocutors, right? Um, I also think it plays a role just in civil society, right? That creating an, um, an, you know, a, a underground railroad for abused women that there's no governing, government component to that. It's not really the political public sphere. Um, uh, it, but it, it, it conditions civil society for its role, you know, for better or for worse, um, as, a, as ballast against the state in, in the economy. Um, so that's, that's how I would answer the, the kind of metaphysical question, if, if I understood it correctly. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Um, I'm not sure that I have much to add. I think that social media, though, can be many things. Um, so it, obnoxious, like, obnoxiously, it's a plural noun, right? Like it's a lot of different things. Um, and uh, they do different, like they have different, so tech people call this affordances. They have different affordances. They afford different kinds of activities. Um, and so I think that's important to keep in mind. So I think they can be a tool for like organizing. Twitter is really good at that, like broadcasting information and, and sort of sharing information quickly and easily. Um, I personally tend to think of them, probably because this is how I treat them, um, I tend to think of them along the same lines as the sort of everyday spaces within that kind of deliberative system, right? They're the, they're the new sidewalks and neighborhoods and living rooms, depending on which platform you're using. Um, where people just kind of gather together and talk about stuff. Um, so. Awesome.
came from a very robust boxing. I'm just wondering, you both could comment on how do I reintroduce some kind of reasonable gatekeeping within social, uh, uh, social media that would function in that way? Or more specifically, you know, what if we should, what if we should take them as a public in the late winter sense? And tell them accountable for the sorts of things that go viral virally with them. So any general reflections on gatekeeping functions of this micro and macro uh, epistemological, um, ontological distinction. The, these are wonderful questions. And I'm going to invite our speakers to use your maximum capacities for concise, <laughs> trenchant thinking, since we've got a minute left to, 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 to respond and you know, offer your, your concluding thoughts here. Um, so I think, I'm not sure that we can separate the two, the sort of virtual from the physical uh, as cleanly as we might hope. Um, this is the kind of idea behind that deliberative systems theory, right? Like I take the Twitter conversations that I've had into the voting booth with me. They inform how I think about like real uh, democracy and formal democracy. Um, they also like reshape the way I inhabit spaces, right? Like I can be talking to like other people who aren't here, here, right? So like, I, I don't think you can disentangle them too. I think that section 230 reform, so changing the like legal obligations of platforms would completely destroy the internet as we know it. It would be a totally different landscape um, in ways that I think is probably like sort of throwing everything out with the bathwater. Um, and so I think instead, this kind of gatekeeping um, that you're looking for, for my taste, would be um, sort of uh, making more robust communities to do the gatekeeping themselves. So again, I think that if you have communities with clear norms about what's acceptable in their space and not a, a, assuming that they also have this kind of like a diversity of thought and opinion, um, that I think that's the sort of most democratic route to take when it comes to gatekeeping. So I think if you think more about your second question, on the first one, the, the implications of my larger argument about legitimacy being a property of the deliberative system is that we shouldn't presume that we need to democratize social media at every turn. Competitive elections in an adversarial legal system can serve deliberation even though the, the, the main actors aren't trying, they're trying to win, not persuade. But with proper institutional structuring, it can yet serve deliberative goals. So similarly, I think we should think about um, how to make social media serve the political public sphere's role rather than democratize, 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 even if there's a presumption in favor of democratization. That's actually a really great note to end on. So I hope you uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for really interesting discussion. And thanks also to the audience members for your very interesting questions. And thanks to CEHV.